And SuitSat is deployed, although haunting. Evoking the image of a stranded astronaut floating away from their spacecraft, SuitSat is on its way, heading into the Earth's orbit. Filled with ham radio equipment, it's ready to transmit pre-recorded messages from school students and enthusiasts around the world. Houston reports a good deploy to ensure no recontact with the International Space Station. SuitSat's orbit will decay in a few weeks, where it will then enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. Hi, Sister Houston, this is Commander Diaz. Do we have any debris close to our trajectory? Evening, Commander. Negative on that. Clear sailing as far as we can see down here. If there was any cause for alarm, you'd know we'd see it too. Your crew members can keep sleeping tight. Well, I'm seeing something out there. I can't make it out, but whatever it is, it's getting closer. I'll tell you, Commander. We're not getting even... Houston, repeat again. You're not gonna believe this. I'm picking up transmissions on the ham radio that sound identical to the suit side experiment. And that debris? It's an Orland spacesuit. I'm not sure I'm hearing you right. Repeat that, Commander? Suit set. I'm seeing suit set. You're mistaken, Diaz. Suit set re entered the atmosphere and burned up years ago. It's impossible. Yeah, I know it's impossible. But I don't know what I'm saying. It's suit set. It's come back. And it's not just in orbit. It's headed right for the ISS. It doesn't make any sense. Say that again. Commander. Man. You need to try it. Oh, is I need to alert the crew. Hey everyone, hike over to the marketplace and get lost in this month's free content. 
mix things up with a procedural generation tool, download a tremendous stylized forest, build a legion of low poly robots, get moving with a modular underground subway, and create your own adventure with a third person template. All available through the end of the month. Plus, raise the roof with the easy building system, now part of our permanently free collection. Just released into the wild, Stonefly isn't your typical mech game. It's a chill and tranquil action adventure. We caught up with Epic Mega Grants recipient Flight School Studio, known for their pinball inspired hack and slash Creature in the Well, to learn all about how an interest in both nature and bugs served as the basis for this thoughtfully crafted, non traditional game. When global brands need to cater to tastes and cultures around the world, Media Monks delivers. On the Unreal Engine feed, learn how this creative production company utilizes Unreal Engine to replace live-action packaging with a CG equivalent to save time and money without the need for reshoots. Last week, we released Unreal Engine 5 Early Access, and many of you have already started exploring the new tools and features. And let us say, your test projects sure do look amazing! Keep sharing your experiments and tests, and during this time, please report any bugs you find via the bug submission form and drop your feedback into the dedicated UE5 Early Access forums for us to track and iterate on. And now over to this week's Top Karma earners. Many thanks to Clockwork Ocean, Mind Surfer Dev, Every Nun, T. Sumisaki, Zeef, Zelj, Dr. Caliginius, Zompi2, Lewis, and Mahokyo. Dashing over to the community spotlights in Wild Dive cross vibrant but unforgiving terrain as the young Ferret Weasley in the frenetic first-person endless runner. Dodge obstacles, cross ravines, slide down slopes, and more for the highest score. Download Wild Dive on Steam. Next up is a short film by Guido Ponzini. Created in their spare time, the R&D project helped them explore the challenges of creating an automotive demo storytelling, rigging, environment effects, and so forth. Share your feedback in the forum for Life is a Rally, Guido's love letter to life, and our ability to continue marching forward, even through obstacles. And last up, give a round of applause for Arnaud Claudette, a student at Rubica Supin Fulgam, who received a rookie for this gorgeous short, the Aorta Valley. Inspired by underwater fauna and Middle Eastern architecture, you can see their process on their Rookies page with a complete breakdown coming soon to ArtStation. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and please let me introduce my co-host for today, Chance Ivy, Senior Technical Product Designer. Hey everyone, good to see you. Today we are going to talk about Nanite, and to help us with this endeavor, uh, I have to introduce Engineering Fellow for Graphics, Mr. Brian Karras. Hello. As well as DeGalen Davis, Evangelist for Quixel. Hey guys, how's it going? who I'm sure y'all have seen at this point, because if you haven't, go watch the Welcome to UE5 um, announced video that we that we released last week. And yeah, this just proves that he is not, in fact, a metahuman, which has been asked Does a it couple though? of times. Yes. Does it, though? <laughs> Does it? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <clears throat> we kind of know. Um, kick this off, I would like to hand it over to Brian um, to just talk a little bit. What is, what is Nanite? Yeah, so Nanite is a virtual geometry system um, now available in uh, UE5. So virtual geometry is a way of um, only kind of drawing the, the amount of geometry that you can see, um, that you can perceive at, at the detail level, um, kind of down to, the, down to the pixel level. So virtualized means that it's uh, streaming in just the data that is necessary to draw that frame. Only that amount needs to be in memory. Um, and through its uh, the, the way that Nanite uh, rendering system works is it only needs the processing power to actually render um, the, the geometry that that you need to see and not really spending much effort on the stuff that you don't. 
So the, the goals behind this, the kind of history, if we go, if we look back a bit, um, I've, I have a lot of experience in my past working on uh, virtual texturing systems, which do a similar sort of thing for texture data. So you only bring in the exact texture data for the, the stuff that actually lands on the pixels in the screen, and anything else that you'd have in memory would just be working like a cache. Um, that has enabled um, artists in the past to be able to use super high resolution textures and not really have to worry about texture budgets as much. They just can kind of um, go nuts with high resolution textures and, and not have to worry about things. So with that experience in, in the past, the, the dream was, well, we'd really like to be able to do the same thing for geometry um, and being able to to do that for geometry it has a lot more impacts than just what it would mean for textures. So um, the idea there would be to get get past numerous different budgets that that artists typically have to deal with, and that that has been a dream that's gone for a long time. Like people have talked about this in various forms throughout the years. It's something that I've been thinking about and researching for over a decade at this point, um, and have had various thoughts on how that could possibly be achieved that have kind of like morphed and evolved throughout the years to try to figure that out. And uh, it, it seemed like it was finally time now. Um, as of a few years ago, we, we kicked off the, the effort in earnest to develop Nanite for UE5. Um, uh, a lot of effort and more than just myself, <laughs> a, a group of us have, uh, have contributed to this technology and it's uh, finally ready for the world to to experience, um, we've achieved achieved that vision to to at least a, a respect that I think is is uh, pretty reasonable for what what the goals were for at least at this point of time. Um, there are things that it doesn't do yet, but for what it does do, it 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 kind of hits hits the target for what we are looking to do, and it's now in your hands, ready to play with. So uh, we'll we'll start showing off uh, some things that we've used used it for and our experiences with working with the tech and kind of go into more um, later on in the stream. I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, about how it works or at least a high level view. Well, that's awesome. And um, Galen and myself were able to take a lot of, you know, the work that you've done on NI and kind of run it through some paces for the Valley of the Ancient project too. I think, you know, we had the Lumen in the Land of Nanite a demonstration from last summer that had you know really great <clears throat> kind of caves and some you know stalactites and whatnot uh, in that environment and we took a little different approach kind of going outside um, there's a number of different things I'm, I'm sure we learned along the way along with you uh, that we can we can probably discuss today but uh, you know <clears throat> I think uh, pretty much in Valley of the Ancient like I think all of our static meshes are using nanite is that right Galen? Yeah, everything everything in here is fully using Nanite, um, which is amazing. I mean, like we kind of mentioned during the presentation, um, every asset that we've loaded in is about one to two million triangles per asset, which is pretty crazy, um, considering we have them scattered in the millions, actually, in the actual project. So, I mean, the math on that's pretty wild. So... Yeah, that comes out to like over a trillion triangles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A million yeah. times a million, and it's actually more than that. There's more than a million instances, and most of them are more than a million triangles. Yeah, I have a, a really fun memory, actually, from GDC a couple of years ago. Brian, I don't know if you remember this, but this is before Quixel was actually a part of Epic. And uh, we were up in a meeting, meeting room in the Epic booth, and you pulled out your laptop and kind of showed us an early prototype of this with, you know, very primitive shapes, right? Yeah. You're like, hey, so yeah. this box here is actually millions of triangles. Um, so just imagine that it's millions of triangles here for the sake of, you know, kind of what we're talking about, you know, and like showing all these different kind of primitive objects. And that was kind of my first exposure to it, it was several years ago at GDC in that meeting. Um, and I don't know exactly kind of how you put it, but you're like, do you guys think you could maybe do anything with this? You know, and it's like, I think we could figure something out. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can make it work. So um, that's kind of my first memory of actually hearing uh, about Nanite. So yeah, it's you guys cool. were one of the first people that had seen it outside of the epic walls. We're like, we really want to do something with you guys going forward. And then, you know, behind the scenes, like 
Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We, yeah. like we should really, we should yeah. really acquire this company. Yeah, I'm I was, on. I was wondering why Galen, when we first started this, that you were really hell bent on getting a bunch of primitives in the environment and not actual mega scans. He was like, Brian showed me some cubes a long time ago, and I really want to see if we can make Cube World yeah, uh, make it happen here. Using yes. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, like some of the the workflows. I mean, this is the first time that um, you know that I had used the tech. Galen, I know you <clears throat> you'd worked a little bit on Lumen in the Land of Nanite last summer. Um, project for Valley of the Ancient um, posed a number of really like unique challenges to us where we hadn't used the tools yet, right? Like, and so I mean, Galen, you've worked on numerous other projects. You know that you've had to go through you know your traditional <clears throat> building. You know, super high res geometry, and then kind of decimating it down, building your normal maps, putting that in there. What were some of the things that were obvious up front that you didn't have to do, uh, or at the same time, where did you go and just say like, "All right, I've been promised this thing, and I want to kind of dig into that." Like, what was what was the workflow for you there? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, to touch on your know, previous projects, I mean, I feel like something that I've been just laser focused on for a very long time, and you know, spent a huge amount of time and effort. Uh, perfecting and you know kind of learning about is normal map projection right you know going from high to low and getting you know the closest and most uh, representative bake that you could possibly get like through that process right and um the fact is is that we don't even need to do that right now i think that that's a really exciting place to be right like one of the things you guys might have noticed if you've actually opened up the valley is that uh, if you load up any mega scans asset um that we have in the environment, it's actually not using a unique normal map at all. Uh, and so this speaks to two things, right? The first being that Nanite is bananas, like just as far as like what you could actually do, right? Um, and the second being that, you know, our scanning technology has kind of gotten to the point to where we actually don't need uh, normal maps to kind of drive a lot of that uh, otherwise kind of macro level detail that you kind of otherwise would need so, through, you know, kind of normal game projection techniques. Um, and so while, I mean, we did lose a little bit of quality, like a small amount, I would say, I mean, we compensated for that with detailed tiling normal maps, which is something that I think adds just a, enough uh, surface variation there to kind of get us like that kind of crunchy feeling that we otherwise kind of wanted for these assets when you really kind of get up close. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the biggest one for me. Uh, you know, I've spent lots of time in ZBrush and lots of time, you know, kind of perfecting cages and doing all that type of stuff forever. And um, this is the first project where that hasn't even been part of the vernacular, which is uh, amazing. So, so none of the mega scans in that demo had unique normal maps. None of them. No, yeah. So we're using our uh, we're using our cinematic high master meshes that uh, you can actually drag in now through Bridge as native Nanite actors. So the U asset actually streams in in seconds, um, and so we actually wiped the unique normal maps for every asset in the entire project. <clears throat> basically for the purpose of reducing file size on disk, because we knew that this was going to be something that people were actually going to engage with and download. So um, so unique normal maps are not represented per asset, and uh, unique roughness is actually uh, not represented here as well. So we use detail tiling uh, solutions for each of those, um, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, I think that, again, it just sort of speaks to, you know, like the quality of the scan assets themselves and, I think that one thing I'd mentioned with that is that, you know, we've we've obviously identified that, you know, Nanite being kind of one of the main things that we want to kind of target, you know, as far as the product is concerned with Megascans, right? Is that we want to constantly refine the processes for actually gathering the tech or gathering the data itself so that we can get as close and true to life as we possibly can from the scan, the raw scan asset down into what actually gets dragged into the engine. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm not an artist, but... Um, one of the reasons I'm not an artist is because of the numerous tricks that y'all have just, you know, discussed right now and making things actually work to both quality and performance as things move wrong. Brian, I wanted to ask, like, um, you seem a little surprised based on uh, Galen's response there. Are there, are, are you are you discovering new things? Like, like when you're setting out to make this technology, right? Like, I, I guess when you're when you're working on stuff that's a little bit more experimental and it's not you know a well established understood space, there's going to be some side effects or some positive things that show up that you're, you weren't expecting. But I mean, was the artist workflow part of the thought with doing this, or was it mostly focused on like how do we make the highest possible quality 
um, that we can and stay performant, right? Like, no, it was uh, so that that was a surprise to me. I I knew that some assets had had done that. I just didn't know that all of them were. That that was the part that was surprising to me. So um, no, it's not having to use, not having to do that bake down to normal maps was was definitely part of the original goal. Uh, for Nanite, or one of the many goals for Nanite, um, but um, on the on the Lumen in the Valley of of Nanite demo, um, it was something that was used for a few of the assets, but most of the Mega Scans um, still had unique normal maps. Um, in addition to the geometry, the the reason being there, not because they had to necessarily, but just the the difference of resolution that you get from like a one or two million poly mesh, but if you have an eight K normal map on it, like the resolution that you get of from an eight K resolution is significantly higher than what you'd get from like a million triangles. So just going for like absolute extreme maximum um, like detail quality, um, that was what was in that demo. Um, so there's there's different approaches there just because. Like when we say you don't have to use normal maps, that doesn't mean that you can't. Like you can, you can make. You don't have to make multi-million poly meshes. You can. Like that's the thing that like Nanite enables that now, and that uh, you can have very efficient rendering of these very high poly assets. Um, like you certainly don't need to have like many million poly meshes. Like. We've shown, and we'll show later um, at, at running live, like we we've have some assets that have shown that are like, you know, 30 million triangles. And like, that's something you could do if you want to do that, it's capable of it. But that's not necessarily the best idea to, to use stuff of that high density level um, in shipping game content because, you know, it'll be more difficult to work with it'll be larger on disk you know it's able to handle the those sort of extremes amounts of data and means that you can directly drop that stuff in without the quality loss and be able to just render it directly um, but it's like up to you how you want to make your assets um, and like what's the best trade-off for disk size what's the best trade-off for your workflow for working with other ddc packages things like that to kind of return to what your what your original question was as far as um, whether artist workflow was was a part of the the goals, absolutely. Uh, like that's kind of how I framed it uh, originally for the the goals of of Nanite was about trying to get rid of um, or or smooth over at the very least, but uh, hopefully be able to just get rid of the sort of thought of trying to hit specific technical budgets and getting a lot of uh, like te t highly technical tuning of artistic content out of the heads of of um, of three D artists, so that they're not having to be constantly mindful of I want to do this thing, I have some artistic vision, but I need to work within these specific technical constraints, or I need to do a bunch of busy work to get the thing that I had made into something that is usable in an interactive fashion, like. Here, I made this thing and I've got it in ZBrush. I have it in 3ds Max. I can render this in in Arnold or whatever, some other offline renderer. Here's this thing that looks great in Keyshot. And now I try to bring it into the game and I have to go through this various process of baking my my um, my high poly down into a low poly and a normal map. And um, I need to make collision geometry for it, and I need to generate multiple lob levels for it, and I need to, um, like, uh, pack the light map UVs. Like, all of that sort of nonsense is are all, like, technical busy work, and those are the types of things that we want to um, either automate or get rid of, such that you could just take that thing that was created, that, like, the, the work went into making it look good, and then just drop it directly in the game and be able to use it without without both the amount of work that it took to get that to be to run fast or the like technical know-how of um, like knowing what you're balancing and um, knowing what budgets you have to hit and coordinating that amongst a larger team of artists. Like, there's just a lot of extra things that weigh on on artists from that sort of point of view that should be ideally unnecessary.
And just to shade that in a little bit further, I mean, you know, for this demo specifically, right? Like we are using the cinematic high master versions of those assets specifically, but like if you're making your own content, like not using Megascans content, right? Like it's up to you to kind of decide like how far you want to push, you know, the tessellation or the density of the geometries in general, right? For anything that you're making, right? I mean, we've done our own personal tests of like, what are the diminishing returns of like, you know, how far you actually push, you know, the numbers, right? And to be honest, you know, like A, B and some of this stuff, like the difference between, you know, some of what we currently have in product represented right now to where we probably could have it, you know, is like we, we're still trying to figure out what that sweet spot is actually going to be for these types of assets. And the same thing applies, you know, to making your own content, right? Like if you're doing some hard surface modeling, right? And you have something that's really basic, you know, just like could just be like a cylinder, right? You don't need to necessarily tessellate that cylinder to the nth degree in order to kind of get the the quality that you need for that, right? But the considerations are always going to be kind of size on disk there, right? Which is, I think is one thing that like, if I were to sort of self-evaluate, you know, on this project, right? I think that we could have maybe gone through those steps of like maybe going through the assets that we actually use for this project, figuring out what the where is that point of like kind of the diminishing returns as far as the density of the geometry and therefore reducing the size on disk for the actual project itself. But in the interest of time is a very, very short timeline for this project. We we just started building, right? Um, so we dragged the assets in and we just started actually kind of constructing that. But again, that just speaks to the power of Nanite here of just I'm going to be dragging in multi-million triangle meshes and just start building immediately with it. So pretty awesome. And, yeah, there, and, there's and, also tools and things uh, for that specific purpose that we're planning on on making that aren't really that great yet. So the being able to do like asset review uh, and being able to trim down the the data size on disk um, as a as a post process, uh, not something where you have to like guess ahead of time. Here is exactly what um, how much you should be dedicating towards this asset and and so on. Here's exactly how many triangles that this thing needs, and here's how big it's going to be on disk. But so that you can late in the game. Um, when you know nearing the time when you need to ship, and you're actually seeing how big is your game sitting on, uh, like how big is the download size going to be? What what is the size of your your game package that you can start trimming at that point um, and make your optimizations after the fact and not have to worry about you know going into some other you know DCC package and and re-importing meshes and stuff like that. So to, tools like that don't um, aren't in the early access build, but. Um, will be in, in later versions of UE5. I like making your compromises later once you have all the information, as opposed to having to do it beforehand and then trying to figure out, you know, what you could have yeah, done better. Right? Yeah, what you really don't want is to like undershoot just to be yeah. conservative so that you're not screwed late in the games. Instead, it'd be great to be able to overshoot it and then trim it back to <clears throat> what you need to ship. Well, and yeah, and to follow kind of what Galen said there, for this project, I mean, we were in a few ways trying to see what we get away with you know and we'll we'll talk a little bit about what we learned in doing that in a second but i mean yeah the the download size for valley of the ancients like 100 gigabytes but even when you package it it's a quarter of that the entire game um and we could have certainly gone further down from there it was just what can we get in in time how far can we push these these bounds for a bit in early access kind of see where we are um and I think we've learned quite a bit about how it works, at least from the going through the, the, the process of building a project that we can, you know, kind of profile and then release uh, to the community. Um, I know, Brian, you, you've been chatting with Galen and, and the Quixel folks and well, pretty much all of us since the, the beginning here. And I know that we were using things in ways that you had not expected um, in certain ways. And um, I know that there are a number of things that, that we learned while, we're, while we were working through this. Um, Galen, do you have anything to add there from, for like, uh, so what was some of the things that we, we tried up front that we, we, we ultimately decided that didn't work or we had to maybe change our approach? Yeah, sure. We can, we could touch on some of those things. I mean, I think the ultimate goal for us, right? Like with this project, it was that we wanted to make it so that whatever workflow that we pursued from an art, from an art point of view was that we wanted to stay in engine the entire time. I think that was something that we really, you know, as far as releasing this type of project day one for people right we didn't want there to be these kind of like barriers for entry like just additional dccs right so um while there's amazing tools that allow us to kind of do that in other dccs it was something that we definitely wanted to make sure that like any person that was watching this day one that they didn't feel like oh well i'm not going to be able to achieve x because i don't have that package right 
Um, and so that was something that we we explored. Uh, and so we actually dug up kind of an old tool uh, called uh, procedural foliage volumes. <laughs> and uh, we started loading nanite actors into those and started to propagate, <clears throat> you know, hundreds of thousands of these objects all throughout uh, the environment just to see if it would actually work. And, um, you know, it did actually work, uh, but there were some considerations that we just needed to kind of uh, take there as far as that. Uh, Overdraw, of, you know, nanite specifically, and then kind of stacking objects, you know, with regard to lumen and the performance implications of kind of those workflows. Um, and so, we actually opted to build this entire four-kilometer environment uh, by hand, which sounds crazy uh, on its face, but uh, it's definitely something that we were we were enabled to do. I would say by the tech in that we built out a palette of assets, right? Not only in just the mega scans actors that you see if you go to just the Utah pack. Um, but we're we're really excited, like I mentioned in the presentation, that we have a new asset type that we're we're debuting, right? Called mega assemblies, and those mega assemblies are basically kind of larger elements that are uh, mega scans assets combined into much larger assemblies, right? Um, and those assemblies allow us to just propagate a huge amount of space uh, in a very short amount of time. Uh, and so what we did is that we actually kind of dragged in a GIS data from the actual location that we scanned in Moab. So uh, real quick, in case anyone hasn't picked up on this, this is from uh, an area in Utah. Um, and it's just an, an amazing space, actually. The scale is just ridiculously impressive, like when you're actually standing out in the desert there. Um, and so we did a scan trip out there for about a week, uh, scanning with drones, scanning with our handheld scanners, everything uh, to kind of get an as much as we possibly could really to sort of recreate this area. And from there, right, we get this palette of assets that we then bash together, uh, just kind of kit bashing, right? Uh, and our guys, you know, are looking at tons of reference, kind of pulling from all the different kind of pictures and footage that we took while we were actually out there in the desert and assembling lots of pieces that we otherwise were not able to scan just because of limitations, right? Like there's, there's lots of limitations as far as scanning, just um, accessibility, right? Like if you look at, uh, you know, just a lot of the the massive kind of canyon walls that are literally hundreds and hundreds of feet in the air. It's like, yeah, we could send a drone up there, but we're probably going to get a very small sample size from that area, right? Why not reconstruct some of that from scratch and actually kind of build it based on the assets that we were able to go and get? Um, and so all that to say that we, we use that GIS data uh, from this exact location and we started layering assets on top of it. Um, and that was something that I think uh, sort of allowed us to sort of use the GIS data as more of like tracing paper, which is kind of the best way to sort of think about it. Um, and uh, if you notice inside of the environment, uh, there's actually not a terrain actor, right? So we had terrain originally, and we used that again to sort of as tracing paper, and we were able to sort of layer assets on top. Now, I want to make sure we really heavily caveat this specific approach here. Brian, I've had many conversations sort of around this topic specifically. Um, the purpose of this demo, again, for us was to really kind of push the boundaries of what the engine can do, right? We wanted to step on as many rakes as we possibly could, kind of going into early access so that ultimately people would have a good day one experience, right? And I think that we did a lot of that. Um, so a uh, shout out to, you know, the entire team for uh, taking all those rakes because <laughs> it was it was a massive kind of lift, you know, from the entire team to kind of get to where we are now. Um, but with that, right, kind of layering assets on top of what was otherwise kind of terrain, uh, everything you're seeing there is densely tessellated nanite geometry. Uh, so it's pretty crazy, like every single inch of the environment hand assembled and is actually represented by geometry. Yeah, all the ground, like all of the ground planes are nanite, like, you know, mega, Do we mega. Bring it up here and, and, and show it. Yeah, cool. sure. Sure. People can look at what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I've got it up on my screen right here. So uh, I was just kind of talking about, you know, like covering the ground, like with geometry, right? So this is kind of a great example here, just sort of one of our mid ground shots, right? Like everything that you're seeing here that's on the ground uh, is something that is represented by densely tessellated geometry, right? Um, so it's pretty neat to see just how far the, the artists on this project were able to push this just as far as, uh, you know, literally just taking these insanely tessellated pieces, right? And just covering every single piece of the, the landscape with it, right? Um, so, I mean, with that, right? Like, this is something that's been a limitation, right? In games for a long time is just, uh, you know, the actual landscape itself and figuring out how to kind of get like as close to, you know, the tessellated look 
that you would have of like actors that are sitting on top of the landscape integrating with the pieces down below, right? And there's been a lot of advances with that, right? Like, I think one of the examples that uh, this was something that we were actually R and D early on when landscape was still sort of a piece of the equation on this project um, is that we we love being able to kind of leverage RVT specifically, right? Like that's something that uh, really kind of gives us a nice variation of color from from different sort of elements like that are actually laid on the ground, right? You can actually have a really nice believable blend from these assets coming up from below it, right? You can affect that transition um, based on some really simple shader math to kind of get you there. And it's really awesome to kind of see that, right? But again, we had to kind of pull back from that approach in this project just in, in favor of kind of pushing Nanite to uh, the furthest that we possibly could. And I want to kick it over to Brian specifically around this approach and sort of talk about some of the pitfalls there um, because we, we did do some course correcting on this specifically, but there are some technical implications that I think are definitely worth uh, mentioning to the, to this group. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm I'm a little blind here. I don't have the feed coming of uh, what you're sharing anymore, so I can't see exactly what you've got on screen. Um, but yeah, I, before we get into some of the caveats, I, I think I would also want to just highlight some of the advantages of this approach versus like um, using just just landscape alone at the very least. And it's not just from the like triangle density point of view, um, which is is still true. It's also what you get from from static meshes and and uh, scanned ones in particular is that it's not just a height map anymore. You don't when you've got um, cliff faces, those cliff faces are now um, can have overhangs that can have actual like um, interesting relief to them, and that can happen not just on the typical sort of you know overhang cave case, which everybody knows can't be done with. Uh, with height maps, but even in this, like the smallest scale sort of situations, when you see um, how how rocks on the ground look when there's a you know rock sticking out of dirt, and it's not just that there's a sort of rocky relief oh, to it. There's yeah. a rocky displacement coming off of the ground, but instead it actually looks like there are rocks because there are <laughs> actually sticking out of the ground. There's there's just some there's a, a realism that comes from that that's just not achievable. Um, through a through a height map only solution, um, so I I think the the sort of results that were achieved with the with the approach that you took with tons and tons of static mesh instances actually gives a, a look that hasn't really been seen before, not at this scale, not at this fidelity level in in real time, which is really cool. Um, I mean, yeah, another another real quick uh, before the caveat. So yeah, the, yeah, the other sure. the other trick that that you know that we weren't able to sort of lean on specifically with this approach, right? Uh, is a pixel depth offset, which is another thing that we've used for a long time in sort of blending assets together, right? Like getting that nice, like kind of dither uh, look between the different kind of groupings of assets that you would place on the ground, right? Um, that was something that we we actually didn't need to use that, right? And we um, the reason being is that since the assets are so densely tessellated, right, they actually kind of butt up against each other really nicely, um, which is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it's so crazy. I, I, found that, I found that to be really surprising too. Like when I first started taking, because yeah, like some of the very first uh, uh, data that I tried testing, like early, early prototypes of Nanite was, was with uh, some Megascans data because like I was trying to find, okay, where can I find a bunch of really high poly meshes? Well, Megascans library had <laughs> has a bunch of high poly uh, meshes to to use. Um, and yeah, it was. It's quite surprising that what you expect needs soft blends. What traditionally you would need a soft blend to go from one mesh to the other, when that intersection isn't like low poly polygonal anymore, and it's actually like a, a actually like detailed um, intersection between them. It's 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 a um, you know sort of noisy um, crooked line. Uh, it's it's not as obvious when it goes from one to the other. They kind of fit together in a in a fairly natural way, even without any sort of feathering. Um, let's see, can I get this going again so I could see what you're looking at? Yeah, so we just got the uh, screen share back for you, Brian and and Galen. Oh, and Chance, since I'm the only one who actually <laughs> can see what's going on on the stream PC right now. All right, uh, I should be back yet. up for you. Okay, it's not yet on his. His PC. There we go. Cool. Um, so, an issue that came up with this approach um, is 
if you try to kit bash things together, um, Nanite in some respects does can handle this really well because it's doing fine grain occlusion culling. Um, so that if you have two meshes that are really heavily intersecting with one another, such that a, um, a large portion of one mesh is below the other mesh, um, and the same thing, you know, going the other direction, that parts of either one of those meshes are completely embedded in the other. Um, those things won't cost you anything. They'll, they'll be completely hidden below the surface, and Nanite will cull all of that geometry that is, is well embedded in something else, um, and it won't cost you anything. So uh, compare that to uh, traditional meshes, and the cost of drawing that mesh is the cost of all of the triangles of that mesh, um, no matter whether you can see them or not. So long as you can see any portion of that mesh, you're going to draw that, and that includes all of the triangles that are well below the surface. That's no longer true with Nanite. For the most part, you just pay the cost of what you can see, and it, for the most part, scales with screen resolution because of that. So it's really, in most use cases, the, the cost of rendering Nanite geometry, no matter how high poly it is, no matter how it's placed, for the most part, scales with the number of pixels on screen. So it gets more expensive the higher resolution um, you want to render at. But there are some situations where that property doesn't work out so well, and those actually show up in some of this content. So yeah, if you go back to the, um, the overdraw view mode, so there are a bunch of debug view modes for Nanite, uh, but different visualizations. This is one of them, and this shows a, a heat map of overdraw. Um, so you'll see in some of these places where, where it's this darker purple um, is where there's not much overdraw happening. But if you actually look at the content, there will be a lot of geometry buried under that surface, and you're not getting overdraw from it because Nanite is, is culling it well. But there are other cases where things get quite hot, and that's places where Nanite is drawing multiple things. So that's like the number of times that, that, that Nanite tried to draw to that pixel. Um, um, that's what this view is showing. So that, that's, that's called overdraw, um, and when it happens a lot, it can be very expensive. The reason why that happens a lot, um, there can be numerous different things that can cause that. It's, fair, it's rare in most use cases, um, but in the Valley of the Ancients demo, the, ones, the one case that can cause this to happen is actually quite prevalent throughout the, throughout the map, uh, and that is surfaces that are really close to one another. So they're buried, but the thing that is buried is actually really close to the top surface. Um, so if you have that just happening once, it can kind of be like it's going to be more expensive than if it wasn't happening at all, but it won't be that bad. But if you get lots of layers of that and all of those layers are really close to the surface, um, the, the overdraw can get quite a bit more expensive. So in this demo, uh, what we see versus some other content that we've tested in the past is Nanite can be maybe uh, up to like 2x as expensive. Um, for for content that is like heavily stacked like this. So this demo in general ends up being about tw like nanite scales up to about twice as expensive as we have seen in in other um, and other content examples. Now granted that's still fairly fast. So like we're still able to hit 30 Hertz in this demo on on Xbox and PlayStation 5. Um, it's just, it's something to know because if you're trying to hit um, a 60 hertz game um, or if, if you can just optimize your content and make sure that that's not happening, um, then, then you can make stuff run faster. So that sort of stacking that I'm talking about, um, are you in a free camera right now or are you, are you on a, a sequencer track? Oh, I can be. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can. So if you want to just like fly in, like crash the camera into the ground so you can... I wanted to call out too specifically that I wish we had some of the pictures of uh, where we got with the overdraw <laughs> whenever we were first, you know, trying to do our optimizations yeah. where the so, whole screen was mostly yellow. So like when I say buried geometry, there is a ridiculous amount of geometry below the surface. And in the places where it gets really bad, um, you'll see a lot of layering up of it. So, so this is an area where it's not so bad. Like that 
already seems like what would have been a absolute like horror for things below before nanite this amount of overdraw this amount of stacking that you're seeing right here actually isn't so bad <laughs> But there are other places in this where it's it's probably five times as much as what you just saw. Um, and those are the places that get really expensive. So um, unfortunately, that's that can be difficult to avoid altogether um, when you're doing kit bashing, especially if you want to cover an entire large scale terrain all with just overlapping instance meshes like um, that's. Doing so is some amount of this is just going to be you'd have to accept for trying to make content like this. Um, but there, there are some approaches that the, that the team has learned um, after doing this demo to, uh, to try to optimize for, for that in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, as, as was previously talked about, like this, this demo was a bit of an experiment. Like it was, how, how would you make a terrain out of static meshes, instant static meshes and nanite? Um, without using landscape, how would you do it completely um, in engine um, and just kind of like push things to its limits? Like how many instances um, can Nanite actually support? Can you cover the complete ground um, without any holes, any cracks, um, just with with instant static meshes? Uh, there was a lot of things that we were kind of pushing the boundaries on and seeing how it would go, how it would work, what you know, like what would we learn from that process? What worked? What didn't work? Um, and this this is kind of the result of of that those learnings in progress. Brian, could you maybe talk a little bit about like the grazing angles issue specifically here? Because I think that that's like something that is that was something that I definitely feel like we picked up on a lot. Like if you, I mean, just quickly to sort of visualize this for people, right? So if you look yeah. at if you look at things that are kind of facing the camera, right? Like these are these boulders up here up top are actually really great examples of like you know these are just placed assets that you know are facing the camera right as opposed to these types of areas where you're looking out and could you maybe sort of explain like kind of the technical implications of like that grazing angle and what that sure. means for making yeah so the when it's when it's doing it's uh, well i'll get into some of this will make more sense when uh, after i've kind of done a, an explanation a bit of of how uh, nanite works sure um, but when it's doing its its occlusion culling it's taking the bounds of pieces of that geometry um, clusters of triangles uh, and it's trying to test to see whether they're visible and when you get in that glancing angle case um, with many flat things, which the, the cases where this happens the worst in this map are the sort of like meshes that look like pancakes. Um, and they have detail to them. They're, they're like scanned bits of ground geometry. Um, and those bits of ground from like the macro scale are, ve are very flat. When you zoom in on them, they're not so flat. They're, they're, they're very uh, like jagged. But if you see them from a distance, they're fairly flat and they um, they're kind of like stacking up of, of like many pancakes and that that sort of stacking they're, they're each one is like ever so slightly rotated and shifted um, such that you see one and then that one goes below another one and then you see that one and then that goes below something else and then you see a different one and all of that stuff was kind of like stitched up almost like a quilt to make the, the overall surface but because they're fairly flat once one goes below the surface of another, um, it ends up being like really close to that surface. But if you see it from a glancing angle, um, that bit of geometry is now, um, it's harder to tell, it's harder for Nanite to know that that piece of geometry is below the surface of another, um, both from a glancing angle and from a distance. So if you like fly up way in the air and look, um, look a really far distance, yeah, like that, and then turn on the overdraw, mode you'll see that it gets like really hot <laughs> as you get really far out so if you're standing on the ground it's less of an issue but if you're like flying up in the drone especially like if you keep on going further and further and further away um it it can become an issue if there's no if there's no merging of these meshes to other things um which was not set up in this project so um, here's that pancake the, the things to know like like in this sort of view, not so bad. It's it's probably will run fairly efficiently. But when you get really far away from it and you see it from an angle, um, it starts getting worse. So it's uh, 
This sort of property isn't universal. I, I guess it's important to note this isn't just like a universal property of Nanite, and all Nanite content will have this sort of um, bad overdraw problem. It's just when stuff is very closely stacked, um, when they're overlapped, and there's there's a, like a stack of in some places there's like uh, you know over ten surfaces layered up in the matter of like a few centimeters like that that's how heavy some of it gets and it's kind of like worst case scenario um it's it's cases like those that once you see them in these sort of uh from a distance at an at a glancing angle sort of thing that things can get uh quite expensive uh, but it all depends on how it's how it's set up yeah and this is where we did like a fair amount of course correcting right like you know we built out you know our set of mass that uh or mega assemblies sorry that we uh that we wanted to sort of use for this project and uh with that right like we were able to sort of get that nanite uh debug view i don't remember exactly when that came online for us in in the early access branch but once we got it, it was like, oh, this is a really, really great way for us to just sort of dissect these pieces and kind of figure out exactly how we should maybe go back to the well and figure out how to actually build these in a more efficient way, right? So um, using a lot of the in-engine modeling tools, you know, just like jacketing certain assets, you know, to kind of call out like areas that are just completely hidden and that type of stuff. Um, and this is going to be something, you know, as far, just as far as product is concerned, you know, that we're going to continue to keep an eye on and figure out the best way to actually build these things. Um, but yeah, we want to make sure that we laid out some of the caveats as far as like how we were actually building this stuff because um we're still developing a lot of this technology on the fly if you can't tell so <laughs> so maybe it would be good at this point to kind of like talk about a bit how it works because some of these things might not make sense until you understand a bit more of like what is nanite actually doing yeah um jump so over to slide yeah if you switch over to my uh my my screen no? yes okay. brian we might need you to just stop and restart your uh, stream to us that seemed to have sure. gone down earlier yep. during our little yep. um, internet out all right start it again are you picking me up checking in and Boom. we're good all right cool um so before I jump directly into the slides, because this is referencing our last demo, I just want to show you that up to give a bit of context so it doesn't seem like I'm referring to something else. Uh, I think there's been a little bit of, a, of some confusion in the community that um, this doesn't work anymore or requires specifically like it only runs on a PlayStation 5, or I think there's been just a bunch of misconceptions. Um, that's not true. It, works perfectly fine in the latest build. Um, it runs great. This is on my my PC. Obviously, I'm an editor right now. Um, so I made this slide deck. Some of these slides are, are were off of uh, off of this demo, the uh, Lumen in the in the land of Nanite. And I'll be showing a bit more of this uh, going forward as, a, as another example of content, just like the, the Valley of the Ancients demo is. Uh, this is also a, a good example, but uh, in a different form. So jump over to the slides. Um, talked about this a bit uh, before, but just kind of like spell it out. The sort of dream that uh, that Nanite is was trying to go for, the like goals that we had, um, was to virtualize geometry in a similar way to how virtual textures work, um, to, to try to get at, uh, to, to try to reduce the um, caring about the multiple different budgets that are associated with geometry so that uh, artists for the most part just don't have to care about these. So that means poly count budgets, draw call budgets, um, and memory associated with meshes. Um, so with these budgets being gone, you could directly use film quality source art, bring it in from, you know, wherever that happens to be created, um, and just like drop it directly in the engine and be able to use it. Uh, and have this like just work, like I was talking about it before, of all those sort of like technical steps that an artist might have to do um, to have some sort of manually optimized for a real time or game purpose, uh, to not have to do that stuff anymore, to have the engine do whatever sort of automatic process is necessary and to make it so you could drop it in and have, have this show up. And, and all of that, not just as a, like a, oh, we can make some sort of like auto LOD and it figures out all the right settings for you, but to in, in addition for it to be automatic and seamless 
to also not like reduce the quality to be able to achieve this. Uh, so that's the dream. The reality is that the problem is like so much harder to achieve than than a virtual texturing system is, uh, because geometry the, like the problem isn't just a memory management problem. Um, geometric detail like directly impacts rendering costs. The number of triangles that you draw um, is going to scale up the the cost that it takes to render that, which is very different than textures, which are just memory that is accessed. So if you have more memory, it doesn't. It's not like every texel of a texture. Um, has to have some amount of computation to put it on screen, um, like geometry has. And geometry isn't trivially filterable um, like textures are. It's very, it's it's very simple to generate a mip map of a texture. It is not very simple to generate a uh, quote unquote mip map of geometry. Um, is there so a name for that yet? For what a mip map for a mesh would be? The, um, I mean, there, there's LODs, which are probably yeah, the closest yeah. form of it. Thing. Um, but even generating those, just like it's very easy to to map a texture uh, yeah. because texture data is filterable. Like you can just right. you can take four texels, you take their colors, you sum, you just calculate what their average is, and that's your map. Um, right. Like you can't just like average up triangles, and then here is the average triangle. And when you display that on screen, it's not the same, like, anti-aliased version of, of a texture at a distance is what a mip map is encoding. Like, that's, that's what I mean by filterable. Um, and that's not true of geometry. Like, the uh, computed LOD for geometry is not going to be a filtered version of that geometry. If you draw it at a distance, it's not the same thing as the anti-aliased version. Yeah. Um, so anyways, there's there's a, a number of different approaches that could be taken to solve this. Uh, there are a lot of them that have been suggested in academia throughout the years. Um, I explored numerous of these um, in, in, in my research and try to solve this problem. Um, but it's important to note um, some requirements that we had for this, uh, that we were not interested in completely changing all sort of CG authoring workflow. So we want to be able to support importing of meshes that are authored from anywhere. It's not like we're, we could only support them in author, authored through our own provided tools. We want to make it so that you can import these meshes from wherever you happen to have authored them. Um, that they'll still have UVs and tiling detail maps. They'll still have shaders that were created in the, you know, the material node graph editor, just like you have been creating them for years. Uh, we only wanted to replace the meshes and just kind of slot in a different thing, not have to replace textures, materials, and all the tools. Like there's just there's, there's a giant ecosystem out there uh, for creating art assets, and we didn't want to have to replace every part of that just because we wanted to change this one portion of the problem, um, which rules out a number of these different other possibilities. So spent a very long time exploring these different options, but for our requirements. Um, haven't found a, any higher quality or faster solution uh, than triangles. So this is kind of the foundation of, of computer graphics for a good reason. Um, so there are other good uses for these, these different data structures. I, I don't want to knock them. Um, there's very good reasons to choose them for different purposes, but for ours, um, this was the best choice. So if we're going to do a, a triangle-based pipeline, um, what would it take to just bring like UE4 up to um, the kind of state of the art? So I'll just kind of like really quickly review this. Um, it's uh, Nanite is a completely GPU driven pipeline. So we, there is a retain, the, the render is now in what would be called like a retained mode. So there is a, there is a complete version of the scene existing in, uh, in GPU memory. It's sparsely updated when things change. So every frame, it is not re-uploaded. It's only the changes that get uploaded to the GPU. Um, that includes all vertex and index data is all stored in a single resource. And then per view on the GPU, it would do GPU instance calling and triangle rasterization. And with, with that done, everything that I've got on this slide, um, we could draw just a depth only pass of the entire scene in a single 
indirect draw call. You don't need to do draw calls for every individual thing. If we do all of this, um, you can do it in a single draw call. Um, so we have all the benefits of GPU driven now, but are still doing a fair amount of work for triangles that aren't visible. So we can add on top of that triangle cluster culling to trim out that, that unnecessary work. So I was talking about this a bit before um, for occlusion culling stuff that is, is buried and can't be seen. This is the reason why, why that happens. Um, so to do that, you can group up triangles into clusters. In our case, there are, it's uh, 128 triangles per cluster. For each one of those clusters, you build bounding data, so a bounding box for each cluster. Um, and then we can call those clusters based on those bounds. We can call them against the frustum, and we can do occlusion culling of them. So if it's hidden behind something, if something is closer than it, and and that cluster is behind something else, we can determine that and then not draw those triangle clusters. Um, but if we want to move past a depth only rendering and support materials too, um, there's numerous different solutions to, to solve that. Um, but we would prefer an option where we decouple the visibility from the materials. And by that, I, I mean determining visibility on a per pixel basis which is what uh, like depth buffered rasterization does, is disconnected from the material evaluation. The reasons why we'd want to do this is that switching shaders during rasterization um, can be expensive. We'd want to eliminate that. We want to eliminate any sort of overdraw from a material evaluation or a depth prepass that would be necessary to avoid that overdraw. Um, and pixel quad inefficiencies from extremely dense meshes, and that's that's definitely a target for, for this tech. Um, we want to get rid of all of those things. So there are some different options. Um, the, the one that uh, was most attractive for us is deferred materials through a technique called a visibility buffer. Um, so what this is doing basically is there are, there are material passes that are deferred, separated from the, rent, the rasterization of the geometry. Um, and we do material passes, one, one draw, per material that is present in the scene, um, not per object anymore. The objects are all drawn at, at once. This is now just like for each material that is present in the scene, there will be a single draw call for it. Uh, and that material pass writes out to the G buffer. Um, it wouldn't need to. We'll, we'll probably end up supporting the forward renderer in the future. But um, for now, that was that was done so that we could mate it up with the rest of the deferred shading renderer without having to change everything going on there. And there's still some very good reasons why uh, why UE5 is, is deferred, um, which I won't get into here. But there are some good reasons why we still want to keep around the G buffer and some of the advantages that that has. So with deferred materials, we can now draw all opaque geometry with a single draw um, it's completely GPU driven. All this work is all on the GPU without much CPU involvement. Um, and it's not it's no longer just a depth prepass, but it can do the materials too. So it's just full on uh, opaque geometry. And uh, we're also rasterizing the triangles only once per view. There's not a depth pass and then a base pass. There's just there's just the single uh, geometry pass, um, which is great because that means um, like it's going to be expensive enough to draw this amount of geometry. We certainly don't want to do it more than once. So with with that, it's much faster than before, but it still scales linearly in both instance count and triangle count. Um, linear scaling of instances can be OK, at least within the limit of scale of, of levels, the number of instances that you'd probably want loaded at a time. Um, we can handle a million instances easily. Um, but linear scaling in triangles is not okay. Uh, we can't keep, we can't achieve the goals of just works no matter how much you throw at it if we scale linearly in the number of triangles. Um, so if we if we used a ray tracing approach, um, that scales with with log n of the triangles, which is nice, but not enough. Um, we couldn't fit all of the data of this demo in in memory even if we could render it fast enough. Like we, we still have to remember virtualized geometry is partly about memory. We're, we're trying to virtualize the memory. Um, but ray tracing isn't fast enough um, for our target on all the hardware that we want to support, even if it could fit in memory. So we really need something that is better than, than log n scaling. 
uh, to think about this another way, there are only so many pixels on screen. Why should we draw more triangles than pixels? Like that, that ideally, we would just draw a single triangle per pixel at most. Um, but think about this in terms of clusters, because that's what we had going with the cluster culling. Uh, we want to draw the same number of clusters every frame, regardless of how many objects are on screen or how dense they are. Um, it's impractical to be perfect here, but in general, the cost of rendering geometry should scale with screen resolution, not scene complexity. This means constant time in terms of scene complexity, and constant time really means level of detail. So we can do level of detail with clusters too if we build a hierarchy of them. In the most basic form, imagine a tree of clusters where the parents are simplified versions of their children. At runtime, we can find a cut of this tree that matches the desired uh, LOD, and that means different parts of the same mesh can be at different levels of detail based on what's needed. This is done in a view-dependent way based on the screen space projected error of the cluster. Uh, a parent will draw instead of its children if we determine that you can't tell the difference from this point of view. This gives us all that we need to achieve the virtualized part of virtual geometry. We don't need an entire tree in memory at once to render it. At any point, we can mark, uh, mark a cut of the tree as leaves and then not store anything past it in memory. So just like virtual texturing, we request data on demand based on what it's, it's trying to render from, from frame to frame. If we don't have the children resident and we want them, they are requested from the disk. If we have the children resident but haven't drawn them in a while, we can evict them and put something more important in its place. So now that we have fine-grained view-dependent LOD and we're mostly scaling with screen resolution, how many triangles do we actually need to draw? Remember, we're trying to hit like zero perceptual loss in detail. So how small do the triangles need to be such that the error is less than a pixel big and is effectively imperceptible? Uh, we can do that, or can we do that with triangles that are larger than pixels? Uh, it turns out in a lot of cases, yes. Triangles are adaptive and can go where they're needed. If something is flat, you certainly don't need to have pixel-sized triangles to, um, to make it look uh, no different than, than the original. Um, but in general, no. Pixel-sized features need pixel-sized triangles to represent them without visible error. It's, it's content-dependent. So is it practical to draw pixel-sized triangles, or in the worst case, an entire screen worth of pixel-sized triangles? Uh, it turns out tiny triangles are terrible for typical rasterizers, hardware rasterizers included. They're designed to be highly parallel in the number of pixels, not in the number of triangles, since that's what their typical workload is. So could we possibly beat the hardware with a software rasterizer? Yes, we can do a lot better, three times faster on average um, than the hardware compared to our fastest primitive shader implementation that we've measured. Even more than that for pure micro poly cases and quite a bit more than that um, if we compared it to the old vertex shader pixel shader path um, instead of the primitive shaders. Uh, the vast majority of the triangles in this demo were software rasterized, so how about the rest? Um, well, big triangles, we can use the hardware rasterizer for those, or other cases that we aren't faster at. Um, it's still good, at, good for big triangles, like that is what it's designed for, uh, so we might as well use the hardware for exactly what it's designed for, we're not going to be able to beat it. So we choose the software or hardware uh, rasterizer on a per cluster basis based on which one we, we determine will be faster. So awesome. all that together, um, like what, what does Nanite performance, like that, that's kind of the complete pipeline in a very like bird's eye high level view. Um, so with all of that, like what sort of performance do we get out of this? Um, so in the, the Lumen in the, the Land of Nanite demo, um, there was dynamic resolution used. This was an earlier version. Um, this was before much of the work had been done on the, the temporal super resolution that's now in, in UE5. 
Um, but regardless, we still used a form of, of temporal upsampling that was kind of from the, the UE4 time period of the temporal upsampler. Um, and on, on average frame throughout the demo, it hovers at about uh, 1400p before the upsample. Um, the time it takes to cull and rasterize all of the geometry is about, happens in about 2.5 milliseconds. Um, and costs a nearly zero amount of CPU time. All that work is on the GPU. Um, and then the base pass, which is the deferred materials, applying all those deferred materials to the geometry that had been rendered out to um, what's called a visibility buffer, takes approximately two milliseconds uh, on average throughout the demo. And that has a small CPU cost because there's one draw call per material. Um, but it really just scales with the number of materials in, in your scene for, for number of draw calls there. It doesn't, doesn't scale with the number of triangles or the number of actual objects instance, instances placed. So putting this all together at four and a half milliseconds is actually totally within budget for, uh, for a 60 hertz game. Uh, what would be comparable before to comparing uh, depth pre-pass pre plus the base pass from, from UE4. Um, so it's also worth uh, talking a bit about the, the data on disk, uh, because if you go completely nuts here, you could easily blow through um, many gigabytes of, of data and have very large game downloads. Um, if this yeah, wasn't well, any yeah. idea about how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we have uh, some pretty good compression. So yeah, the big triangle counts would be would be really big if we if we didn't compress them and Nanite is. Uh, significantly more compressed um, format using our own proprietary compression format than what the standard uh, static meshes were without Nanite enabled. Um, so in, in this demo, all of the Nanite data on disk in its compressed form comes out to 16.14 gigabytes. Um, so it, you know, it's a decent chunk of, down, of, of size, but it's not ridiculously huge. I think there's some misconceptions that um, there was like hundreds of gigs of, of nanite data, and that's just not the case. Um, in this demo, the texture data was far larger than, than any of the geometry data. I think that was probably true for the, the yeah. Land of the Ancients demo as well. Um, I, I'm not sure the exact numbers there, but I think the numbers for, for the nanite data were, were fairly similar in size, uh, maybe, yes. maybe even smaller than this. Yeah, it was, I think we were smaller as far as the, the geo goes, but we were a bit larger in the textures just because we had so many different assets. Yeah. So, um, anyways, these these are kind of numbers. You, your your own will 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 vary depending on uh, what sort of uh, resolution you go for and how much different variety and, and kind of how all that stuff is optimized. But at least currently, on average, it's about um, fourteen bytes per input triangle. The actual nanite data stores more triangles because we store this whole like. Um, hierarchy of clusters, so there will be more triangles stored in it, but uh, this is kind of on average for the, the triangles that you import. So with that, if you import a 1 million triangle mesh, um, it will be approximately about 4 megabytes on disk on, on average. It'll vary, your, your mileage will vary depending on what it has, um, how, like, there's various attributes on that of of how it will how well it will compress, but on average you should see something like this. And it's worth noting that that size is actually smaller than a 4K normal map, Con considerably smaller. A 4K normal map will, will probably be more like 20 megs on disk. Um, so it's it's not not a crazy amount of data um, to get a fairly high fidelity mesh. Um, so it's also worth noting that uh, that Na Nanite enables some new techniques that just um, weren't really the, all that practical before. So uh, a key one is uh, virtual shadow maps, which uh, we haven't talked a ton about so far in, in the in the video. Um, and some of that is known out there, and people are starting to play with these. But uh, it's some really cool tech. It's it's worth uh, talking a little bit about. Um, so all shadow maps now with virtual shadow maps are are 16K by 16K, um, so way, way higher resolution than, than you've seen before. Uh, and the way that this, that this can be practical is that um, it, just like Nanite does, kind of picks the, the detail level of what, to what matches up on screen. So it picks um, 
to, to render the, the shadows such that one texel matches up to roughly one pixel on screen. Um, and then using the virtual shadow tech combined with Nanite, we only render to the shadow map pixels that are visible on screen. Um, Nanite culls and, and lods it down to, to that detail level required. Um, and uh, we support caching as well. So we can adra avoid drawing anywhere in the shadow map that, that we've already covered in a previous frame. So that means, for the most part, only the region of the shadow maps that were updated each frame um, are the ones that, uh, that objects are moving in. Um, so not only can Nanite draw the entire scene just once, it supports multi-view rendering so that it can render all shadow maps for every light and scene in the scene to all of their virtual virtualized MIP maps at once, only drawing into them where is, where is needed. So, um, so you want sharp shadows? You've got them now. <laughs> Virtual shadow maps can, can do that in a way that, that wasn't really possible before um, without ray tracing. Um, so we've got the resolution to go sharp, but no one wants razor sharp shadows everywhere. Um, so we, we simulate a physically based penumbras by, by ray marching through these virtualized shadow maps. Um, it's also cool to note that uh, it no longer requires manual tuning of, of depth biases. That was another goal of, of this effort. Um, so shadow acne and Peter Panning artifacts are, for the most part, not, not really present. Um, there will still be some cases where there'll, there'll be some issues, but, but nothing like before. It, it for the most part, just kind of works. Um, so... Nanite is real. It works today, as you guys are uh, are playing around with and seeing for yourselves. Um, and this demo, and then the following one, the the, the Land of the Ancients demo, we've, we've tried to push it to its limits. Um, and it's kind of kept up past expectations for the most part. Um, but it isn't done yet. Like, there's, a list, there's still a lot more that we wish to do. Um, it's very workable. Like, obviously, you guys have seen that you can make cool stuff with it, but uh, there's things that we're, we're still planning on working on, still planning and improving. Uh, the, the compression is absolutely one of, the, one of those. So the numbers that I, I mentioned a few slides back as far as those, those sizes on disk, we expect that we can shrink those pretty considerably um, because we're, we're only really scratching the surface for, for what sort of uh, compression methods that we can use. Um, but there's also some other things that are noted in the documentation that uh, it's it's worth highlighting. Um, it's We've focused on rigid geometry first because that's over 90% of the geometry that you're going to have in, in a typical scene. Um, so this was our, our highest priority. That, mean, that doesn't mean that the whole scene can't move at all. Um, you can move individual objects around, you can scale them, you can rotate them, you can translate them. It just doesn't support like non-rigid deformation. So skeletal animation um, and other sort of deformers like that. Uh, world position offset, unfortunately, is one of those. Um, we also don't support um, translucent or mass materials um, and don't yet support tessellation and displacement. Um, it's not great for aggregate type of geometry. That doesn't mean that... Uh, so ag by aggregates, I mean like many tiny things coming together to become like a, a porous volume. Um, like like leaves in the canopy of a tree, for example. Um, it won't do as well of a job, but that doesn't mean that it can't still be fast. Just don't expect it to be the sort of like magical, um, it scales to the, uh, the cost of it only scales with the resolution on screen. That sort of property um, works in many cases, but will likely not work in this case, but it could still be pretty fast. So anyways, uh, uh, that's kind of the, the slides I had prepared to explain kind of how it works. Um, showing it in motion, um, you guys have seen this demo before. Uh, I won't go through all of it again. This is, this is it running in the editor, by the way. So that's obvious, I'll full screen it here. So what I was talking about before with that sort of detailed shadows, um, they, they get very, very sharp and detailed, which is great to be able to show off that sort of intricate geometry. Um, because without that, you won't... It's, it's harder to tell the difference between geometry and normal maps when they're 
when there isn't self shadowing involved. But when we have that real geometry and we can cast shadows from it, you can really see the 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 definition um, in in a geometric form when you could see all those little details casting shadows themselves. So, anyways, let's. Awesome. There, there was some uh, some misconceptions that we put this like crack in here to like hide streaming. Uh, I, I have the whole level loaded in memory right now. <laughs> it was actually so that we could just show the camera getting like really close to this rock. <laughs> so it's just an excuse to put the animation there. It, it wasn't really to hide any sort of streaming things. So, it's, it's, hold on. on that note too, like this is before we had implemented any type of world partition or anything like that as yeah. well. Or, or <laughs> yeah, so the, this is all with the previous like sub-level streaming. Um, this isn't using world partition because this came before that tech was uh, was ready. Um, anyways, fly up here, you can kind of you could see a bit of that difference of the sharp versus versus soft shadows. Um, Go into the, the view modes here to look at. So let me turn off the anti-aliasing so it stops shaking. Um, so the, this is a view of the individual triangles. Um, the video compression is probably going to suffer a bit here just because of how uh, noisy it is. Yeah, um, if you turn off anti-aliasing, some of that jitter goes away. It doesn't help a ton, but it might yeah, help. Yeah, I, I just did. So if, if I get in really close here, you can see here are the size of the actual triangles. So it's we're not drawing points, we're not drawing voxels, we are drawing the actual triangles. And when you get close to it, these triangles are the ones that were imported. It's it's not like uh, Nanite resamples your data into some other form. Um, it's just once you start getting further away, you might be able to tell that it's changing what triangles it's drawing. But what's easier to see is if we switch over to the cluster view, so like how I was describing that there's this hierarchy of clusters, these are those clusters. And as we get closer, it swaps those clusters out for different ones. And what's important to realize out of it, and the reason why this, this works at all, is we're trying to keep, essentially, I mean, it's the, the math that it's doing is a bit more complex than that, but... Um, from a, from a basic understanding, we're trying to keep the size of the clusters about the same size on screen because each cluster is the same number of triangles. There are 128 triangles per cluster. And if the size of clusters ends up staying roughly the same size at all these different view distances, then that means that the number of triangles that we're drawing on screen is about the same at all these different distances. Uh, and we can... I can show that exactly with Brian, just real yep. quick checking in here. Did you have a hard out today or can we continue for a bit? I don't. Okay, great. Cause the amount of questions we've received and the amount of questions we have from the previous stream are starting to add up. So I just wanted to make sure yeah. that we get a chance to cover some of them. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll try to accelerate. We don't want to stop you. <laughs> okay. No, okay. No, no. I'm going to <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all good. all good. Just making sure you you don't have to ditch real soon. Right. And Galen, so, uh, I assume you're good as well. Yeah, I'm good. Perfect. So, awesome. Please continue. So, so I'll turn that, that visualization off so you could actually see the text on the side of the screen. Um, you can bring this up yourself with typing nanite stats into the into the console. This shows what what nanite is actually drawing. Um, there's there's two passes because it uses a form of two-pass occlusion culling. Um, but the key thing to look at here is the number of triangles down here at the bottom uh, that it draws after these two passes. So the number of clusters, um, which should be obvious, and the number of total triangles. So even though the, the number of triangles in the source geometry for this might actually be over a billion <laughs> of what it would be for all the meshes that are visible, the number that that Nanite actually draws, rasterizes to the screen, is much lower than that. It's still fairly high. Um, it's in the tens of millions. In this case, it's 12 million for this view. But as you change for different views, we can see this in numerous different scenes. So if I go back to the, so the last one, see here it's 
it's about you know 16 for all these different views it ends up being fairly similar um like no matter what geometry is in view it doesn't really get much more than than 20 million tri triangles and that's that's is kind of demonstrating um this concept of it scaling with screen resolution so no matter what sort of content is thrown at it it's it's similar in its cost and that cost is mostly in the way of of number of triangles so before i move on we can take a look at I've, I've just made a, a test here for to show off the shadows. Um, so I've got a point light there with, uh, with light, a source. Light wasn't in the demo? No, I, I mean, this hallway was. This is the area that uh, the Beatles, they were, they were walking around here. It, it has been running for like hours in the background. So I don't know, the, the Beatles all walked away, I guess. Um, Anyways, so I, I just put this bicycle in to get a really thin object so you could see the, the shadow as well. Uh, so these are like, like physically based shadows with proper penumbras. So uh, they're really sharp right at the, the caster. And then as they get further away, they get blurrier, uh, which is exactly what you want for, for area light shadows. And when, when seen in an actual setup, it's less obvious to see that effect, but it's happening everywhere. Um, you know, that's that sort of sharpness near his near his fingers and it gets, you know, quite blurry as it goes further out, which really gives a lot of uh, a really nice look to the shadow casting. Come out to this next scene and and we've talked about it before this this statue um, and well, every one of the statues is all the same statue um, is. Uh, is was like 33 million triangles, I think. Um, how the original source geometry, um, and it's like it's insanely detailed. Um, but in this scene, I think there's close to like 500 of them, making it the such that there is like very clearly billions of triangles of source geometry in, on screen. But you can see again over in the corner that we're drawing about 22 million triangles in the end. So if I show the, the triangle view will be really hard to see with, with, uh, with the video compression. Um, but if you look at the clusters, again, it has that same sort of attribute where as you get closer, the clusters stay similar sized on screen at all these different views and it just draws more or less um, triangles as you get closer um so still even though this scene is far more uh far more complex um it's still running it at similar performance um to you know the hallway that we were in before even though there's there's these hundreds of these many million poly uh, statues in the scene, as well as, I mean, it's important to note, all of it is kind of insanely complex. The, the art in this is it's just incredible. Uh, so I put a couple of things in this scene that weren't there previously, just to, to show something and kind of dispel another myth that I think is, is out there. Where, where did I put them? Here we go. So I've got that bicycle again. Um, I wanted to highlight, although we've shown off a lot that, uh, that Nanite is great for, for rendering these really high poly uh, mega scans for, for photogrammetry sort of content, for very organic stuff, whether it be scanned or ZBrush sculpted, those sorts of things. Nanite also supports hard surface model meshes as well. This was actually a, a key reason why we didn't pursue some of the other possible approaches that wouldn't have been a great fit um, for hard surface. Um, so if we, if we look here, like there's, there's still, uh, let me actually reduce the FOV so we can see, we can look at some of this stuff closer. So if we look at these gears, they're, they're actual, you know, geometric gearing. And we look at the, the chain, it's, they're individual links in the chain and they're all modeled out. 
So if we look at the the polys in this case, it's not it's not uniform. There's there are big triangles that end up going across those um, slowly changing surfaces, and then there are cases that have really tiny triangles when when stuff gets really dense. Um, another example of this is is this uh, bust from Chain, a character um, in Paragon. So this is the high poly mesh that was used to bake the normal maps for this character in Paragon. Um, this bust is 3.5 million triangles. Um, it's uh, it was sub D modeled for all all of the sort of mechanical bits and. The the organic parts, his, his skin um, was, was ZBrush sculpted. And Nanite does a really good job of that as well. And it's also, this is also a great case to show off just like how, how sharp these, these shadows can get. Yeah, it looks amazing. Um, so, and then one last fun, fun bit before, before we, uh, Move on to some questions. Fly out here to show this vista. Um, I just I don't want anybody to get the impression that I skipped something because on purpose <laughs> because it doesn't work. No, like this this vista still works, and it's also worth noting like all of the stuff here in this vista is all detailed out to the same sort of insane geometric wow. detail as like all of it. Every bit of this, it's all built in the same way as everything else. So last little bit here at the end that I didn't even realize until preparing this last night for the stream. If you come all the way down here to the end where, where Echo walks through this portal at the end, the ring on the portal is not a mesh itself. It's actually made up of these instances <laughs> that were placed on the wall of the previous area. All of these around. So if you go to the instance view, they're all individual instances duped around in a ring. Kit basher stream. Yeah. So it's it's a it's worth mentioning that that's another like we talk a lot about the triangle count. Um, of how, how Nanite can enable these like really high poly meshes, but that like both of these demos really kind of dem really demonstrate the power of of huge amounts of objects in the scene and what you can get out of that and the the power of being able to kit bash those those huge number of meshes um, and like what that sort of what that enables so. Yeah, and then taking that same, you know, kind of like super dense, high poly, you know, or high resolution meshes, everything, uh, and building on an entire level like this, and then using some of the open world features that we have in Valley of the Ancient. I mean, you could kind of just keep this going and keep this growing um, as it streams things in and out. So you're trying to stay inside memory and whatnot without, you know, having to sacrifice the amount of uh, instances you have in your game or your experience, right? Yep. Fantastic. Awesome. Before we move over to questions, and we can probably be there for a while, uh, Galen, I wanted to make sure that um, there was nothing that we left off here that you were planning to cover. Uh, no, I mean, I guess we had one note here just about uh, texturing these types of assets. Do we want to touch on that really quick? Yeah, let's dive into yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think this is this has been a question that's come up a handful of times actually, like and it's a very fair question from the community of like hey, so you, you guys have shown these ridiculous models, right? You know that have millions and millions of triangles, but uh I'd like to texture these things. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> right? And uh one of the things that I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware of, so with Mixer now being entirely free uh, for the community, um, that that by the way I mean entirely free, right? Um, so you get access to the entire Megascans library, and you can actually go and retexture assets if you'd like. So um, I was actually just kind of noodling over here, like while Brian was talking on an asset. So I've loaded in the highest resolution version of this asset from Utah, 
I'm getting very high uh, frame rates here, working at 4K, just created like a simple smart material here. Um, you know, so just like kind of grabbing like this this asset from Utah and just quickly retexturing it. Um, and so uh, I don't know if this is something that people are kind of aware of, but you can very easily just start to grab these types of assets and reconfigure them however you'd like. Um, and then I'm not even... <laughs> I'm not even using, if you notice at the top here, I haven't even downloaded our newest version of Mixer. So I'm still using the 2020 version, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, we've made some really amazing modifications to uh, to that tool as well, to where you can actually bring in multiple uh, material IDs and uh, texture, uh, pretty complex assets, you know, at uh, pretty detailed resolutions as well. So um, there's something to be aware of uh, that, uh, like, and also if you... If you want, one thing that's really nice here, if I just go up to the setup tab here. So as you can see, I'm using the highest resolution version of this asset. So millions of triangles here in the viewport. Uh, you can actually load in the lower LOD versions of that asset. Uh, you can texture at that level. You can also reduce your working resolution here. Lots of ways to kind of scale it. Uh, and then you can bump it up to the highest level and kind of get uh, textured assets pretty quickly. So. Um, so anyways, I just figured we'd kind of touch on that if that was something that the community was not aware of uh, as far as texturing really, really dense uh, assets. Yeah, we've definitely received a lot of questions in regards to UV unwrapping um, as well as tessellation, landscapes. Um, Y'all think we can cover some of those a little bit? I'll sort of generically taking about, I think there's 10, 20 different questions in regards to uh, sort of how are we going to work with our UVs? Uh, can we shed a little bit of light on that? What we've been talking about um, at Epic? Um, so yeah, the, these meshes are just like, the Nanite meshes are just like any other static mesh uh, from the, the import point of view, like what data comes into the engine. Um, so they'll still have UVs, they'll still have texture maps, mapped to them just like uh, any others. Um, as far as how how to UV them and, and other DCCs, I'm not going to be the best person to, to answer that because I'm not an artist that goes through this like day to day. Um, but I can share a bit about what I've heard from our art team, um, which is uh, think about UVing early um, and kind of keep that in mind. Uh, keep, keep in mind that that the fact that you will need to do that um, and don't leave it towards the end. So if you have like duplicated elements, so uh, for example, there's the, the shield of that soldier has a bunch of duplicated bits of detail that go around the, the ring on the outside of the shield. The artist that, that sculpted and modeled that uh, mentioned if he was, if he, would have UV'd that bit before he, he started duplicating it, he wouldn't have had to worry about UVing the thing after it had been repeated many times. Um, there's a similar sort of uh, thing happens when um, if, if you make, uh, if you start adding subdivisions on your mesh, um, if you can UV it before you start adding the subdivisions and start sculpting in more detail, um, or if it's just a, a, a standard smooth uh, sub D, if you can do those sub, if you can UV it before you start adding subdivisions, it'll be much easier than if you try to UV it after you've done things. Um, so I, I guess that would be one thing I would try to impart. Um, we don't, I guess that it would be useful to say we don't really have a, um, a, fancy UVing solution ourselves in, in Unreal to solve this problem, at least at the moment. Um, so a lot of it just, I think, is going to come from um, just experience of, of artists in the community and kind of like sharing what, what you learn um, and teach us as well. Like if you, if you find techniques uh, that, that help this sort of process, um, share it. Uh, we, we'd like to know we're, we're learning just like you guys are. Yeah, I would add to that as well. I mean, you know, the the modeling tool set that is that's in the engine currently is, you know, still still being developed, obviously, you know, with a lot of the other features in the engine. There are some auto UV features that are in there. Uh, we're working very closely, actually, with the modeling team on the art side to make it so that those tools allow us to do a lot more than we otherwise would uh, kind of in. Uh, earlier versions of the engine. Victor's getting attacked, I think, by a fly. So like one banana fly. It's just really likes my face apparently <laughs> yeah it's it's also worth noting that uh you can store things in vertex color 
on a nanite mesh. Um, so that's another possibility as well. Um, I think there might be a video that is going to be posted uh, in the future for, for us showing off uh, how that workflow could work. Um, it's not something that we've done a ton of testing on yet. So uh, again, that's another area that we're, we're experimenting with and we'll share what we, what we find out as it goes. Yeah, we actually, we did a small amount of testing with that actually for Valley. Um, and I don't remember that Topaz time is very bizarre as far as like how it actually, I don't remember like when we were doing those tests, but I think we did, uh, Victor specifically did some tests on that, uh, Victor Oman, and he did a great job of kind of uh, showing some ABs with that. I don't remember, I can't quite remember why we decided to not go that route uh i'm not sure if it was size on disc or just a b and its stuff quality but um but yeah i think it's something that we'll definitely explore in the future so thank you so, both go ahead. yeah on the on the topic of like future support uh there's been a handful here that have come through and victor kind of touched on a bit but like tessellation animated scale skeletal meshes world position offset other deformations anything um, that's on the roadmap, anything that, you know, you've got an idea of how we're going to tackle or we're not going to tackle, those kinds of things. So those things are a little bit on a, on a further horizon. I don't, uh, they, they certainly won't be coming for like the full 5.0 release, um, but they're, they're very much on our mind and we've got ideas on how we can attack them and would very much like to start getting, uh, getting movement on that soon. Um, things will probably be happening in a shorter time frame is, uh, better scaling up for high instance counts. Um, so like already these we've the Valley of the Ancients has one to two million instances in it. Um, we're looking to see how, how far we can push um, instance counts. Um, some uh, extra just like editor tooling, trying to get uh, uh, improvements on compression. And those are things that are kind of like in the in the shorter time frame. Uh, but yeah, some of those those bigger ticket things are 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 definitely uh, planned on the horizon. Sounds good. Um, on the topic of like supported hardware, um, where are we kind of right now as far as what Nanite works with, what Nanite requires, and where do you think we might go uh, kind of next, whether it be for five point or in the future? Oh, I, d I don't have it in front of me right now. We've we've got our our documentation for for what we're what we're supporting for the exact like model GPUs. Um, so for right now, it's NVIDIA and AMD. I think N NVIDIA is something like a 1080. Um, I think is the the min spec for for Nanite. But I don't know. don't don't quote me on these things. We, we've yeah. got official <laughs> documentation for what those are. Yeah. We can send people to the docs for that. Cool. There were quite a few. I just want to go back to sort of question in regards to landscapes and and how one today might want to um, approach that if that's what you are looking to do. Um, I guess twofold question: Are are we developing a new method to produce landscapes, or should folks, at least in sort of the uh, about the now time frame until say 5.0 full release, should they just be using regular static meshes if they're looking to use uh, Nanite? Um, so if you're looking to explicitly use Nanite, um, we do not have anything in a short term time frame for Nanite landscape support other than something of the of the style of, of Land of Ancients, which is, um, yeah, lots of uh, static mesh instances. Um, I guess the, the other thing that I would point people at if you're looking for um, a higher density landscape is there's an experimental feature called um, um, virtualized landscape. Is that the correct name for it? Uh, virtual Virtualized height map landscape. I think that's it. Um, so um, you could try experimenting with that and we'll give you much denser um, denser geometry than the traditional landscape will. Um, it's, I think, in, an experimental feature right now. And I think that was, was out in 4.26, um, but will then, will then be in UE5 as well. But I, 
I am not the expert in that. So I've, those details are probably off considering I don't even remember the exact name of it. Yeah. It's the your virtual high field. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, I would need to dig up Jacob's amazing flow chart that we were talking about before we started streaming here. There are some dependencies there that I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, Maybe with regard to Lumen, I think. That yeah. Are so, kind of so Lumen in the early access build does not bounce light off of landscape currently, uh, but I believe that's intended to be uh, supported by 5.0. And uh, that doc that um, Galen mentioned, we wanted to kind of sanitize it and get that out to folks too, so they could kind of see um, what in early access is and is not supported and some of the things that we've learned along the way. Like we said, this is in many ways a experiment for us on how a lot of this works. Um, and you know, the Quixel team found out so much of what we can do. Yeah, one, one thing that I, I would add to this topic of uh, terrain specifically is that, uh, you know, Brian and I have been having some offline conversations about this. this is something that we hope to work very closely together on as far as kind of solving this and creating what could be, you know, like landscape 2.0. Um, you know, we're not exactly sure exactly um, all the details, obviously, like uh, as of this call right now, but um, it's something that we're definitely thinking about. It's stuff that we really, really want to tackle. Um, so expect more in the future. Yeah, definitely. It's it's clearly, clearly something that major, um, major improvements can be made in that sort of workflow and the, the quality that could be achieved with, uh, with a different sort of approach and some new tech. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a bit more future. That's certainly not going to be in a 5.0 time frame. Next question comes from, I'm not sure I can read that. Are there any papers you would recommend to read to understand the nanite technology? Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention. So if you're looking for more information on Nanite, um, I will be doing a, uh, a talk in the Advances in Real-Time Rendering course at SIGGRAPH um, in a couple of months. So check that out for far more in-depth technical breakdown of, of how Nanite works kind of from top to bottom. And I'll have tons of other paper references and things uh, in that talk. You know you're talking to the pro when, uh, when when the pro goes, yeah, just watch the talk that I'm about to do in, in a bit. That will be the best information you can find on this. Uh, yeah, there will be a white paper as well. What we're yeah, <laughs> I'm writing it. Um, Thanks, Brian. This is, this is a good one, Brian. I think we discussed this early on, but I'd like to hear it from you too. So how has Nanite changed collision creation for assets? Do don't we need that anymore? Can we have super complex collisions? I would say that's kind of like a, it's, there's two ways to look at that. One is about the actual assets themselves. And then two, oh God, what does that do to physics, right? <laughs> uh, it doesn't change anything about physics. <laughs> like physics still has their own constraints. The, um, they, they need things in a similar fashion than they needed them before. Um, there is no nanite for physics yet, at least. <laughs> Um, so as far as what they need, like you can still author collision meshes and provide those as, as custom imported, uh, collision if you choose, um, for, uh, to provide an automated way of getting, um, either a complex collision or the simple collision. We have some tools that, that are in engine that you can, you can read in the Nanite documentation, uh, for it generating what we call these proxy meshes are kind of just like a stand-in old style static mesh to use for any of the places that that uh, that don't interface directly with the nanite data structure yeah and generally what we did for valley of the ancient was um we certainly didn't use you know billion poly collision meshes for everything lest our computers explode on us trying to calculate that stuff um, but we did prioritize certain areas like um, you know the ground where the characters walk uh, we wanted that to be a little bit higher res of course right so we could show off some of the fbik stuff but a lot of the actual meshes that are out in the scene you know we were we were kind of judicious about our budget for those kinds of things and and, and made decisions based on what would actually matter to the gameplay. So same kind of as before, um, certainly don't want to bring something in, import collision as, you know, whatever the native one that comes in there is, um, still be a little bit thoughtful as you put those things together. 
Yeah, we uh, one thing that I think is worth mentioning while we're talking about Collision. So we actually made a custom tool when we were creating Collision for mega assemblies because that was going to be a pretty serious concern as far as like how we wanted to kind of tackle that. Um, you know, with the process of actually making those packed level blueprints, right? Like we're literally jamming millions and millions, and millions of triangles, you know, kind of kit bash together and sort of create something new. Um, we created a blue utility. I think Marion and Aaron were the two kind of guys that kind of worked on that specifically, uh, where it's effectively like a Vox wrap. So using some of the modeling tools to basically throw a blanket like over the top, for lack of a better descriptor there, throw like a blanket over the top of the mesh and be able to sort of decimate that down into something that's actually usable. Um, and that was a really, really amazing kind of tool that that allowed us to actually create very performant collision for those assemblies. Um, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to release that specifically. We probably have to do a little bit of cleanup for that. But uh, when we actually do properly release the Mega Assemblies pack, it might be something that we can include because um, it might help certain people out with some of the, the problems they might run into in creating custom collision for geometry or for nanite uh, geometry specifically. And that might be something that we can talk to Aaron and Marion about, you know, just discussing maybe in a future live stream or put out some docs about it and stuff, because it's a really powerful tool that we utilize quite a bit on the project. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to mention here, because I think there's a, a really cool story with Valley of the Ancient. Great Wild Buffalo asks, if Nanite can't do foliage due to transparencies, why not generate foliage as polygons? <laughs> we did. <laughs> we actually tried that. Um, I sent it to both uh, Brian and Whiting, and it's like the stuff of nightmares, I think, for engineers. It's uh, it's absolutely horrifying to look at. Um, I'm so not sure I saw that. Oh, really? I don't know. Uh, I don't remember that. I might be able to pull it up here, actually. Oh, don't don't look at my screen yet, IT team here. I'll have to pull it up so I can find <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, no, we did actually try that uh, specifically. Um, and uh, it was pretty crazy. So we actually used uh, we actually used an external application to kind of generate that. So the way that it worked was effectively like we used the opacity maps like from uh, from uh, the actual assets themselves, like the vegetation, uh, and then we were able to kind of take that and tessellate it inside of Houdini um, to create something like that. But I. I'm not going to be able to find it here in the short time on the stream to sort of show that. But there were some limitations there, obviously. Uh, I think, you know, one of the main problems is like the thin and spindly bits that kind of make up most pieces of nanite as you start to get further away. They turn into these crazy like spider monsters uh, <laughs> as it currently exists. Brian, I'm sure you've seen that where it's just like this like weird ball that starts to like, it looks like a weird tumbleweed or something like that. But Yes, uh, send that mesh to me. In places where I've seen that happen before, those are bugs that I have fixed. I have not seen one that does that in a long time. So okay. if you've got if you've got a mesh that does that, I still have a bug to fix. A contender for you. So yeah, no, it's a. Uh, but no, one of the th one of the main limitations that we had actually. So as Brian mentioned, um, currently we're not supporting two side materials with nanite, right? So foliage actually looks really goofy when you don't have that uh, applied to it. Um, we were able to kind of hack it in 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 a certain way, um, you know, being that there's some subsurface properties that you could designate to uh, those those objects, but it was again just didn't look right when you place it in the world. Um, and again, it's just not something that we could necessarily prescribe like from a product level at this point. So we decided to abandon it. Um, but yeah, no, Brian, I'll send you the uh, screenshots. They're absolutely terrifying. So. Cool. Yeah, send me the mesh too. I want to oh. see what's going wrong with it. Sure. But uh, yeah, I, I guess what I'd say with other things is uh, try it out. I, I'm actually interested to see what, what you guys have done. That I've seen a few in the community of, that have brought in um, full geometry trees and we're getting some interesting looking results already. So yeah, try things out, see how it works. Um, if you make a giant forest of them, it probably won't perform super well. So I definitely wouldn't recommend building a game with this assumption that this would work out. Um, but like, as, as always, do your do experiments, profile, see what things are, and and share if you learn something cool. Yeah, yeah and, sure. and right. it's worth it's worth noting too. Like, if you guys do open up Valley and you see the project itself, you will see that foliage is is 
really kind of the only thing that's not nanite like for for the desert specifically right so when you switch over to that debug view and you start looking at it those are the only things really that are not nanite in the entire project oh uh, on that note i think it's important to maybe call out something we learned um and graham from our team was on to us quite a bit about this um flipping off nanite to show what renders and whatnot will show you what you need to convert to nanite um, and so for us, you know, we have our character echo and the grass. So anytime we would flip that off uh, to to just make sure that anything that got in was actually converted over to be a nanite mesh, um, as long as that was the only thing in the scene, we were in good shape. But Brian, can you explain why that might be? Or is it kind of like a use mostly nanite or mix is maybe bad or like what what is the what is the kind of rule there? Yeah. So I guess the the rule of thumb is for the most part. If you can, you probably should enable Nanite on static meshes. So for anything that Nanite supports, I'd recommend turning it on, especially if you've got a scene that has lots of Nanite meshes already in it. Um, even if it seems like there won't be a benefit for that, let, let's say, like, in these demos, we've got cases where, where we have just, like, blocker geometry to block shadows, and it's just like a cube. And the question would be like, well, I mean, it's a cube. We, we don't need to make that nanite. Well, um, so far what we've seen, it, it actually works out better and how it mixes with, uh, with the um, virtual shadow maps. At least that's been our experience so far. It's not critical to make everything nanite, but the general rule of thumb is if, if it supports um, what that mesh is being used for, if nanite supports what, how that mesh is being used, um, we'd recommend switching to it. We haven't done as much testing with scenes that are quite low poly. So if you took um, a complete scene from, say, it was like built for, for last generation stuff, it wasn't really built with Nanite in mind, and you've got a whole scene filled with, uh, with lower poly meshes, um, your mileage may vary there. I'd be interested to see uh, what sort of results people get there. I haven't done as much testing for that sort of thing. It's most of this experience has been in these sort of projects that were for the most part nanite. And the question was, well, I have this other thing. Does it need to be nanite? I don't really, it doesn't matter that much. Should it be or shouldn't it be? The answer so far has been, yeah, for everything that can be, use it. And yeah. it's cool to see the community too. I mean, like if you're just browsing ArtStation and YouTube just in the last week, right? Like to see the number of people that have taken scenes that they've developed in UE4, right? And flip all the levers on to kind of get like that UE5 experience, right? Like that's that's been really cool to see. And I, I'd really be interested to see kind of the data behind it too, of like just A, B and some of the perf numbers there, seeing like what it actually looks like with having everything now just switched, you know, to virtualized geometry. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I would be very interested if, if anybody has numbers like that of their, their scenes. Like, we only have so much data ourselves to compare on, um, and we should probably be doing a lot, a lot more uh, investigations and gather those numbers for the scenes that we have internally. But there's so much more data out there in the community than we could possibly ever uh, test ourselves. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested if, if you guys have numbers out in the community to... to, to let us know how, how that ends up working out for you. Uh, I guess there is one... One extra thing to say there as far as the, uh, again, we've talked a lot about this, you know, super high poly meshes, but uh, Nanite is also really good because it's all completely GPU driven for handling really high instance counts and not having uh, to deal with the draw call sort of performance. So even in scenes that might not be high poly meshes themselves, it, it can scale a lot better to, to high object count scenes and reducing the, the CPU burden. Uh, for a scene that would previously have been fine on the GPU, it might be might run a lot faster on the CPU after enabling Nanite. In regards sure. to the topic of when, if it works, if Nanite works, could we touch a little bit on um, multi-view stereo virtual reality um, and what the future for Nanite might look like there? Uh, yeah, there's there's no real technical limitation there at all. In fact, Nanite should be even better than than the traditional pipeline because um, Nanite can render. It, we already support multi-view in a way. Um, it's the it's the reason why we can draw to all virtual shadow maps in a in a single pass. Um, we just need to do the plumbing. 
basically. We need to hook up the split screen and we need to hook up stereo rendering for VR and make sure that those pads are using the same sort of Nanite multi-view functionality so that you'd be able to render both eyes in a single a single draw. We could render split screen, two different, completely different views in, in a single go. Um, we just haven't connected the dots yet. Split screen is a good call out because that's something I definitely haven't seen anyone ask for, but that's a good way to think of about it if you're not as used to um, tackling stereographic uh, displays such as VR, etc. Um, thank you for that, um, Brian. And next week, for all of those of you who have asked about Lumen, we will be covering Lumen next week on the live stream. So we'll get into that as well. Um, we had a question here from Porsuk who is asking, are, um, are we able to transform any older object to Nanite version with one click, or do we need to spend some quality time to do it? Um, no, but it really is one click. In fact, you can convert many assets with a single click. Um, if you select a ton of assets in the asset browser, you can do a right click menu and there's just a way that you can convert all of them in a batch operation. Or alternatively, it's just a checkbox in the static mesh editor. These are static, these are just like um, in code, they're a use static mesh class. They're, they're the same asset type, they're the same static mesh asset type um, as before. It's just a checkbox on it which tells the, the engine to build this nanite data structure and store that instead of what it, what it used to build. And then when we render that mesh uh, for, for the frame, it goes down this nanite rendering path. But otherwise, from the, the data asset point of view, it's just a static mesh. Um, and really, it's just a click box. No workflow changes there. Just what you've got is going to work. Is it represented in the bulk property matrix, Brian? Do you know? Uh, probably. Yeah, so, sure, probably. Yeah, I, I think you could probably enable it that way as well, but we we added a special uh, there's a there's a nanite thing in the right click menu. Mm -hmm. You can specifically yep. enable things in bulk selection. Mr. Sarn asked, is there a limitation on unique objects? It seems like it is more focused on many instances of a few high res unique objects. Is that correct? Um, no, not really. Um, so as always with unique data, the more different pieces of data needs to be stored uniquely in memory. Um, I, I guess that should be obvious, but as far as Nanite's efficiency in rendering, it is actually, um, more, are more efficient than previous techniques for handling instancing, um, where instancing before um, it would be a draw call for each different instance static mesh. Um, so each time you would have a different mesh that would be instanced many times, it would be a separate draw call for each one of them. With Nanite, it's a single compute dispatch or single um, draw indirect call for all types of meshes in the entire scene. So like the entire scene goes in, in a single pass, um, regardless of whether they're, you know, a million instances of the same mesh or many different instances of different mesh types. If you had a million different unique meshes, um, that might end up consuming a, a huge amount of memory. Uh, I don't think we have any examples of, of trying to push it for that much different unique, different types of meshes. Um, but there's, it, it doesn't really, um, other than just the like amount of base memory for having a, a mesh in memory, there's not really any sort of performance cost for it. It would be more just a, there might be a memory impact for having like a million different, that, that one would probably cause problems. I'm not sure what our actual limit is as far as like number of unique meshes that can be loaded at once is, we probably have one. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah, it's interesting when you're not using the draw call as a measurement for that, right? Um, of getting those statistics out. That's another one of those that the community can just go nuts on and see how far you can push it, right? Like, I think that there's um, somebody out there that's probably already working on that. <laughs> it could be. I, I'm pretty sure there's an actual number for it. This could be a problem, but I would have to look it up. I don't know. It, it's, it's, large, it's large enough that it has, no, it has not been a concern for literally anyone in Epic so far. It's just, there's only so many. Because, like, that also comes down to, unless you're building these in some sort of procedurally generated automated way, 
there's just only so many meshes artists can author and how many of the ones that you could actually reasonably import um, before you just run out of time. Yeah. I think for our mega scans, I mean, we have like a few hundred in there, right, Galen? Um, I don't think it's even a hundred actually. Not really. It's over than that. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I deleted about 300. That's what it was. Cause we had like the whole download and we ended up down there. That's right. Yeah. yeah I, I, I guess I should wrong. say there, there is something that's not specifically the mesh, but on the material, there is a draw call per unique material in the scene. So if each one of those meshes had a different material, which is fairly common, um, then, then it could start scaling up with the number of unique materials. But if there are many meshes with all had the same material on them, should should render just the same. I have a personal question. Uh, for, oh, it's, it's my question, not from the community, but ha I'm sure you've seen the photo scan dog and the tens of thousands of things in there. I just wanted to make sure you had seen it because it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's it's great. I was very happy to see that. It's it, the way that that tweet was phrased was like, I got up to a thousand before I got bored. And it was like, my reaction was, ah, yeah, that's great. But only a thousand? How about a million? Because <laughs> we can do a million too. I like the dog, and I also like the bananaite. That's yeah. that's my other yeah. one that I, I love. So, really, yeah, that must have been what you were imagining. Whenever you're putting, <laughs> how can we make infinite poly bananas? Oh goodness! Right. All of ever dreamt of. Um, mm -hmm. Next question comes from Derek Verveer, who's wondering, will Nanite support translucent and masked materials? That's a good one. Not currently. Will it in the future? Um, yes, Ma masked is, uh, is something that we're, we're definitely interested in. Translucent becomes harder. Um, because of this, uh, how I was describing, there's, we do this, uh, we rasterize out to this thing called a visibility buffer and then apply deferred materials coming off of that. Um, it's That doesn't work. You can't do a deferred material to, to something that has, you know, one pixel has many layers of materials that all contribute to that pixel. Um, that technique only applies if there is one material that gets applied to this pixel, which means it has to be opaque. Um, masked is not within the engine terminology is not opaque in how, you know, that, that selection box says opaque and masked, but from a conceptual point of view, masked is a form of opaque just with a texture mask, deciding where it is opaque versus right. where it's non-existent. <laughs> um, so masked is something that, you know, especially from the, the foliage or you know, chain link fence, you know, there's a, a many examples where you'd want to use that um, is attractive, to, for us to support, um, but is a bit of a challenge to to do so. So we need to think through how to make that happen. Um, re really, it's like if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, the reason why that's challenging is that um, we would need to evaluate an arbitrary shader um, for what the the mask value is in the middle of rasterization, and that rasterization right now is a fixed function compute shader software rasterizer having it do an arbitrary shader evaluation in the middle of that is something that we can't really support at the moment um, and if we add that support in the future um, it'll have to be delicately handled to not make it tank performance which if we did it naively it absolutely would it's kind of a similar problem to mass materials in, in hardware ray tracing where they support it, but if you use them, things start getting slower pretty rapidly. Um, so it's a we could do the same thing with a great deal of work to just make that work at all. Um, I'm not sure how value it would be if the performance tanked. So we have to do it carefully. I'm actually going to yeah. hear that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go, no you go, Chance. I'm turn. super curious about this one. Uh, can we manually tweak the density of the triangles or clusters based on distance, or is it something that's fixed? Um, it is fixed, and that is actually on purpose. Um, the algorithm for that it's doing is complex enough. <laughs> 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 if there was an area such that artists could start controlling it, um, 
having those edits actually persist after a change would also be complicated. Um, so if we make an, a change to how the algorithm that builds the Nanite data works, make an optimization and improvement in the future, I don't know how it could possibly retain that data. Right. Um, and then like to how you would how would we expose an edit towards it? Re really, the 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 core design here is to try to make it so that you wouldn't have to do such a thing. That it's just completely automatic, such that you don't need to care, and then you won't have to waste your time with it. Um, I understand the motivation though, because although Nanite ninety nine percent of the time um, the algorithm works perfectly, and you get something that is imperceptible as far as uh, its degradation as it gets further away. It looks like the original authored mesh as you'd see it in uh, you know, some offline renderer. Um, but there are cases where it fails. They're, it's not perfect. Um, so it may make some guesses that, that Nanite thinks it's making an imperceptible change, and it actually is perceptible. Uh, in some cases, it's very clearly perceptible <laughs> because it actually like looks pretty bad. But those cases are extremely rare, um, and like I extremely rare, such that uh, hopefully that we won't really have to support any sort of artist editing of them as sort of on a fine grain sort of detail level. Um, if we do add sort of artist tweakable knobs, that will probably be a very like high level concept, which is um, maybe like here's a whole area of it that I want to preserve at a higher detail level. You like paint in and say, I care about this or here's a fix up area. And it wouldn't even be like a care about it would be because it should be caring about the things that matter automatically. But it'd be like a uh, it's screwed up right here. So don't screw up there next time or something like that <laughs> or an even higher level thing which would be just an entire slider which is like this thing seems to degrade quicker than it should be you know bump it by by 50 percent and yeah. don't don't reduce the triangles as quickly for this one asset um but it's a great question though because right? i mean that fear stems from probably if i had to guess from this user that's asking this is like you know hey maybe i have horror stories of like you know lod's you know jumping and popping like on previous projects like and i want to be able to control that like as an artist right that totally makes sense now i can say having worked on both of these two projects that that has been a non-factor uh, on either of them so just uh hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to digest <laughs> yeah it's it's funny how uh, I mean, it's very challenging to build this piece of software, <laughs> I assure you. But uh, it's funny how much easier um, simplification, mesh simplification gets when what you're targeting is not giant polys um, that have some sort of like meta meaning, um, the sort of like, sh like, human perceptual shape meaning and start turning into like pixel size differences. Once things get down to that level, um, some of the, the challenges of building level of detail actually get easier. And then you just have to deal with the, well, how do I actually achieve that level? Uh, yeah. Which is difficult, but that does sort of, I guess those sort of like what, what you might be used to for a really bad quality auto-generated level of detail. Um, that sort of level of detail, if you draw it really, really tiny on screen, you stop caring. I guess is, is kind of the way to summarize that problem. That makes sense. Victor, I interrupted yeah. you. So. Oh, you're good. There's just, you know, a plethora of questions, so yes. um, we'll continue down the list. Next question comes from Gamer Lieber, who's wondering, will Nanite support um, procedural meshes? Um, not anytime soon. So that that's uh, the data structure that, that I discussed at a super high level, and there's a ton of inter intricacies to make this actually work out. The cluster hi hierarchy is semi-expensive to build. Um, so we've worked a lot on making the all of the Nanite data building pipeline as 
as well optimized as the I'm not sure if there's just as much, but a fair amount of time, <laughs> maybe not equal, but almost equal amount of time has been spent in making the build efficient and super parallelized and just trying to trim down the time to take to build the data um, as there has been to to render that data. And the reason why is that we, we want to make it so that when you import your data, you're not like waiting for minutes or and worse than that, hours waiting and waiting and waiting to get your thing in. Because if that was true, like no matter how great we could make the, the runtime experience, if you had to wait for hours to get your thing in, it just doesn't matter. You wouldn't use it. Um, so we want to make that process as fast as possible. But that said, it's still a, a heavyweight operation, um, something that can't really be done in real time. Uh, because there's a lot of things that it needs to compute to build that hierarchy such that it doesn't create cracks and that we can get a high quality result without a unreasonably huge number of triangles drawn. Like to get those sort of numbers to look like 20 million triangles on screen for this resolution um, is the care needs to be done to make that happen. So if it was a procedurally generated mesh, uh, sorry, I, I'm assuming by procedural meshes, what you're saying there is like procedurally generated every frame. Uh, right. If you're talking yes. about like procedural output from like Houdini or something like that, in which case I would say it already works. <laughs> but I'm assuming you mean procedural, like runtime procedural. Yes, runtime. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, probably not going to be supported. Or if we'd ever figure that out, it won't be anytime soon. I just I don't know how to attack that problem at all. And if you don't, then I'm not sure who would. I mean, I I, I don't want to say that it's completely impossible because I don't know. Maybe two years from now, I was like, aha! Um, but I have no I have no idea how to attack that problem. I'll take a crack at it, Brian. Don't worry. <laughs> Game jam it out next weekend. I guess. Let's see. Um, we had uh, another question from Crucifier. Um, is it advisable to use Nanite for lower poly meshes in a very large scene with multiple instances? So yeah, I think we talked about this already. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, if you've got very high instance count, Nanite will probably be more efficient than not. Um, and as always try things and profile like uh, that's that's always going to be your the best answer to a question we can give advice but at the end of the day um, we can't we can't guess all the things and we can't know exactly what your data is so always try things in profile but yes if i were to make a prediction i would say yeah in a lot of cases nanite will be faster in some cases significantly faster than uh, nanite disabled I remember seeing another question. I, I didn't. It's somewhere in the doc here, but it was in regards to: Are there still any reasons why one would want to optimize a, a the poly count of a mesh when you're using Nanite? Is there any reason? If if you had an A and B button, one would you know export less, one would export more. Is there any reason to go with less? Absolutely, and the biggest reason is disk size. Um. So yeah, it's the, the size on disk is going to scale up linearly with the number of triangles that were imported. So when I gave those numbers, as far as like approximately, it'll be about what I say, 18 bytes per imported triangle. If you could import less triangles, you'll get less bytes on disk. Um, there's also the sort of knock on effects of when you're authoring things um, in other you know, modeling packages, working with less may make your lives easier. So if there's not a quality reason or a workflow advantage from working in a higher thing, like if, if it's not saving you time and it doesn't end up in a better quality results, uh, then, then don't, don't waste your time doing it. Uh, well, I, I saw guess you'd be the thing there. Uh, as, as we mentioned earlier in the stream, though, um, there are some tools that I'm hoping to get in um, for, for future versions of Unreal, maybe even 5.0 to have it so that you could make those make those determinations for um, what is the like maximum quality, what is the, the highest number of triangles that would be there when you get close. 
um, to be something that you could tweak in engine after the fact. But even in that case, like that would be that would save you on the disk space side of things. So you could adjust that afterwards and essentially change the you know, it would be similar to you changing how you imported it originally. It would just be, oh, there would be a after import modification before it's it's stored out in the nanite data structure. Um, but then it would be like, well, how much time did it take to import? <laughs> if it was a smaller mesh, it would take less time to import. So yeah, it really just comes down to um, do it if it, you get perceivable, like valuable, better quality results, have, have more data there. Um, or if it's making your lives easier by not having to optimize or bake out a normal map or some other step that would uh, would cost you more time. I, I saw chat almost joke about this a little earlier. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, not only is it less time to import, less disk, disk space, but it's less for your teammates that are on a VPN coming to the office to actually yeah, download. So that, yeah, there was something on that topic that I, I wanted to bring up here, um, but that you're just reminding me of. So when we talk about disk space, um, it's, I think most people are going to assume to see how big these things are on disk, I can look at the U asset for that static mesh sitting in my directory in your project folder, look at that and say, aha, this is how big this asset's going to be. That U asset contains a lot more than just the nanite data, and it's not necessarily stored in the way that that will be in the final packaged cooked version of, of the game that you would ship. Um, it includes the actual source data, um, not in exactly like an FBX format, but something like that in a completely lossless way and stored out not in a compressed form at all. It stores other bits of metadata about that mesh and how it was imported. So there's the source asset, and that can be fairly large. Then there's the, the nanite data or, or other render data that, that could be generated if you had nanite disabled. That will be stored not in the U asset at all, but stored in, in the, the DDC, the derived data cache. Um, that's the actual data that would end up in your final cooked version. But even that, as it's stored out directly for for DDC data, has is before any sort of um, like platform specific compression. So, like for example, on PS5, there's going to be additional like Kraken compression. Um, on other platforms, there'll be some other form of LZ compression that's put on top of that. Um, so, if you look at just that file, if you could find it, it's going to be some weird like hash numbered thing um so if you look at those sizes um they won't be the final compressed size they'll be significantly larger than what you'll end up with on disk so i think there's there's going to be this this sort of misconception of like oh you said it was going to be this big but it's like 20 times bigger than that what are you talking about um that that thing that's bigger is not the data that we're talking about. It's not what you'll end up shipping at the end. It's your like development data. But as Chance was saying, that can still be burdensome as you're developing things because everybody that syncs to your source control um, is going to have to like get that data too. Um, there's for future versions of Unreal that will in be improving the, that process, will be improving cooking and uh, storage of that stuff and, and how the DDC works to make, make that process uh, a bit more streamlined. But um, those are concerns worth, worth considering. Just how much of your hard drive space do you want this project to consume? Um, can, can be a factor, even if your final download is only you know, tens of gigs, it could be hundreds of gigs. Uh, and, and that can be seen just like in the Valley of the Ancients project, like the actual project that you download from us is, was it like, 100, 200 gig or something like that? It's right, over, right around 100. And then you actually, <laughs> so you download a copy, and then when you make a project, it makes a copy of that over, right? So yes. the requirements are kind of high, right? But then when you package it for, for shipping, the thing of how it would end up on, say, like a PlayStation, for example, is more like, I, I don't remember what it was, but it's 20 it's, gig? Yeah, or yeah. I, when 64 is like 26, 20, 25. So we're looking at like 75% of what you would actually download there. And again, we didn't go through the process of, you know, being selective about 
am I ever going to see this mesh to the point that it needs to be this many, you know, polygons? The same with the actual texture data. And still, I think the texture data is the vast majority of that size, not necessarily the mesh data. Yeah. So unfortunately, how it is right now to see what is the stuff in your final game package that's taking up most of your space? Like if you just wanted to see, hey, this mesh, I just imported it. How big is it going to be final compressed on disk? Um, we don't have ways of displaying that easily in the engine right now, um, which is actually a big problem. So it's something that we're going to be improving going forward to, so that you can better analyze and understand um, what what of your assets, t textures, meshes, whatever is contributing to your final uh, your final package size. And, and on that, it's not the exact same one to one, and I wouldn't say it's seventy five percent. You know, just take whatever, and then times point two five, you get the final. But in the content browser, you can still select assets and use the size map there to at least get a good idea of where everything is on disk, right? And you're probably going to find that the vast majority is going to be textures. I'd like to tackle some questions that we received during the last live stream as well. Um, we have already done, tackled some of that just throughout the presentation. Um, but one question that came in was if Nanite will support world position offset. Um, so that is a form of, um, of deformation, arbitrary deformation of the mesh. Um, there's, there's actually, a, I, I could just like run off numerous cases of these. So skeletal meshes are one of them, like morph targets on skeletal meshes is different from like linear blend skinning with bones and skeletons. Uh, world position offset is a form of it. Um, spline meshes, although that's not really an animated form, it's still, it's still a way to deform a mesh in a way that isn't just as simple as a, as a scale. All those types of things are not currently supported with Nanite. Um, we only support like rigid meshes so that you can translate, you can rotate, you can apply non-uniform scale, so different scale on all three axes. Um, that is it. That is what we support for, for Nanite meshes currently. Um, world position offset is, is obviously super useful though, um, and it's something that we want to support in the future. Uh, but that kind of goes along with solving just the deformation problem in general. Um, so I kind of lump it into the same bin of if we can support arbitrary deformation in all of these various forms, um, WPO would be, would be in that bucket that we would be wanting to hit in that entire effort. Thanks. I actually went through pretty much all of the other questions that were related to Nana during our previous stream. And I think we have covered pretty much everything um that came out of that stream um chance were there any more further up that you were interested in snagging for today i think there's still a lot of really great questions in here that we could dive into i know we're kind of pretty far on time and i think galen has to get a haircut i'm just kidding <laughs> but, but i think that we can probably collect some of these things and take back to the forum post and see what we can get answers on for things we didn't cover a lot a lot of the ones that have duplicated that have been coming through as dupes i think we've answered mm -hmm. pretty well like the big trending ones for sure i had I had one for brian brian someone was asking if we can share the slide deck after the stream that you were presenting uh sure <laughs> cool we'll we'll figure that out offline just have to ask you first you know just don't just want to start uploading your stuff um we will get yeah. that to you all uh all yeah. of that information that's related to the live stream topic um, that includes it ever in the future, if we if we do have a sample product that's specific for the live stream that we share, any slide decks, any other presentations or documentation, you can always find that in the forum announcement post, which is on the events section of the Unreal Engine forums. Uh, and that is also where the link to the slide deck download will be. Actually, I should modify my answer there. Probably, I will have to ask people. <laughs> <laughs> if if it's a yes, it will be in the forum announcement post. Um, and then there was, I guess, uh, a question I wanted to leave till the end, um, which I thought was interesting, was where, where did the name Nanite come from? How, how did Nanite come to happen? Um, there was a lot of different <laughs> suggestions. Um, so really, it was like early on, I usually don't, personally, I don't like giving uh, just like brand names for features that could be just explained for just what it is. Like 
Um, for for instance, the like virtualized shadow maps. We didn't come up with some flashy name for those. It's just like it is virtualized shadow maps. But it started becoming um, difficult just in the code, where there was a lot of different algorithms that all fit together to form what Nanite is, and it wasn't. It couldn't really. There was there was no name that didn't be get like ridiculously long that could kind of sum up all these things. Or if it did use one name, it would just be about one part of the data structure or one part of the algorithm. So I really needed to have like, I just needed a name for a namespace <laughs> to put around all of it. So then it started becoming hunting for a name and it had nothing to do with any sort of marketing. It was just like, what can I call all this code um, so I can refer to it, so I can namespace it. So we went through a lot of different names. Um, it was actually, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this. I'll, I'll avoid saying that. It used to be called something else in the code and then got renamed. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. But anyways, yeah, in the hunt for the name, um, the reason why Nanite was attractive was we're trying to talk about really tiny things uh, to refer to the sort of like micro poly stuff. So, um, so I was like, oh, micro meshes. Nah, that's actually like a type of clothing. So... <laughs> I didn't want to call it that, and uh, like, oh, nanoscale, like nanite, nano something, um, and I don't know. I'm a, I'm a big uh, cyberpunk nerd, so nanites was uh, came up, and people liked it, so we went with that. That's great. Yeah, naming anything trying. is hard. <laughs> naming things are hard. You, yeah, you just described what it goes through. I'm trying to name a variable when I know exactly what it does. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, just naming things in the code is hard enough, but when it also needs to be like a public name, you need to make sure that it doesn't clash with something else. Like if somebody's going to Google something, what hits are going to, like what is already existing that it could conflict with? Uh, yeah, it's hard. It is hard. Um, any last thoughts before we actually wrap this wonderful time together up with all this information? I just can't wait to see what people come up with. I mean, I think that's the most exciting part about like early access. And that's why like the, you know, the surprise at the end of the presentation was one that we kept pretty close to the chest, right? Like it's been super inspiring just in the last week, just to, like I said, pop over to YouTube and look at ArtStation and just see what people are making. I mean, and we're only like a week in. It's crazy to see like how far people are already pushing the tech and, um, tutorials that are popping up and everything like that so I, i'm just super inspired um and I, I just can't wait to see what other people come up with so yep that's my exact same response is can't wait to see what what you do with it and uh especially so in the like otter use cases like it's great to see um people making stuff that looks like the stuff that we've put out so far and seeing people get really high quality results of like just quickly just drag in this bit this mega scan that mega scan and like some of these like very like first day art station posts were like really gratifying to see it's like wow that is a great looking shot and it you provably did this in one day because yeah. you didn't have this yesterday <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, like i know for a fact you made this scene today um, so that that's really cool to see, but the the ones that are also really exciting for me to see is like try using it in something in a way that's like completely unlike what we have shown so far. Um, I'm I'm really right, excited right. to see a lot more like hard surface model cases. I'd I'd like to see people try out stuff that we even suggest might not go well. Like try try making a polygonal tree out of it and see what happens. I'd love to see it. Just yeah, make 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 stuff like we haven't seen before. Thank you both so much for coming on the stream today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I know Galen, we will see you again next week. So, so we'll chance. Um, so biggest thanks to you, Brian, because I'll, I'll get, to thank them. <laughs> get to thank them more. Yeah. Um, if you are still watching and you've been with us here from the start, thank you very much for tuning in today. We do have a survey that we link every week that you can go ahead and fill out. Let us know what we did good, what we didn't do good, what you would like to see in the future. Unfortunately, the next two months are kind of occupied with all this U5 stuff that's going on. Uh, but we do add all of the recommendations to our list of um, streams for the future. 
Um, so we try to find the right people for. Um, if you are new to the world of game development and Unreal Engine and you would like to get started, you can go to unrealengine.com, download the Epic Games Launcher, and install UE4, UE5, whichever one you would like to choose. That's a whole conversation on its own. If you're learning, though, and looking for a lot of materials, Unreal Online Learning, which is learn.unrealengine.com, contains a lot of uh, tutorials for UE4, and there is no reason why you can't use a tutorial for UE4 and then apply your knowledge in UE5. The UI might look a little different, and the placement of you know uh, checkboxes, etc., might be in different spots. But the knowledge itself is fairly almost the same. I don't know. Can I say the same? <laughs> At least when it comes to the features that are in UE4 and um, that have now sort of moved over to UE5, um, and that's a great place to start. Um, Make sure you like and subscribe on all of the places. We got the Twitters, we got the Facebooks, we got, you you know what, what they are. I don't have to repeat them more again. But the forums are a great place where you can talk to other developers in regards to your projects, your problems, anything else that you might have. Uh, and I also like to do a shout out to unrealslackers.org, which is our unofficial Discord community where you can do that in real time, uh, which is great. We're all on there, I think. I don't know, except Galen. Galen's not on. Um, <laughs> That's internal pun. Weird. All right. Community spotlights. <laughs> Every week we highlight a couple of the projects. Go ahead and add us on Twitter. It's a good place. The work in progress section and release on the forums are also good, as well as the Discord channel. Uh, we follow you as much as we can, and we try to find everything around there. You can also just go ahead and send an email to community at unrealengine.com. Uh, it's another good place in case you haven't announced anything public and you would like to let us know. That's always cool. Okay. Tell you that. If you stream on Twitch, there's a cool Unreal Engine tag that you can add to your streams. Um, go and combine it with game development if that's what you're doing. That's the easiest way for folks to find you and your live content that you are producing. Um, make sure you hit that notification bell on YouTube. I just like, like and subscribe, but there's that bell as well. Um, and uh, next week, we are going to cover Lumen, um, which is our global illumination technology that was released uh, with U5 in early access. And we're going to have Daniel Wright, Galen, and Chance on for that. So a couple of familiar faces, which will be will be great. Um, and once again, do want to thank Brian and Galen, and I guess Chance, too, for coming on. It is nice to have Chance here. Um, I'm enjoying the, the 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 duo hosting. I can focus on these pages and pages of questions. <laughs> oh, um, cool tops happy on. to be here. This has been awesome. Thank you, Brian, Galen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. This was awesome. Cool. And any conversations following up in regards to this topic, feel free to use the form announcement post. Um, we will be looking at that um, quite intensely. All right. It's time to get off. It's time for our weekend. I wish you all the very best. Stay safe out there, and we will see you again next week at the same time. Bye, everyone. Thank you.